Okay, well, hello everyone. Welcome to the centenary of the introduction of combinators. Um, we're hoping to uh, celebrate this uh, kind of, this is exactly a hundred years after the talk that was given by Moses Scheinfinkel in uh, the um, building that there's a, a copy of behind me here. So I myself have been kind of a combinator enthusiast for about 40 years now. Um, I don't believe I've ever talked about combinators um, in public before. And uh, this is a, a particularly daunting way to do it because we have uh, with us um, essentially uh, all of the um, uh, mm -hmm. very large fraction of the world's um, uh, experts on combinators. Um, I think this is kind of channeling what it might have been like for Moses Scheinfinkel back uh, 100 years ago on December 7th, 1920, um, as uh, the Göttingen Mathematical Society got started, um, because probably sitting in the front row was David Hilbert, um, uh, kind of the uh, most prominent mathematician in Göttingen and, and perhaps uh, uh, worldwide at the time, uh, ready to, to comment on Moses Scheinfinkel's uh, uh, talk. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of channeling that feeling here. So. What we're going to do is, is I'm going to talk a bit about combinators, um, explain a bit about what they are, their significance, um, some things we now know about them a hundred years after they were uh, first announced. Um, then uh, when I'm done, we'll, we'll kind of turn it over to um, uh, Q&A and discussion with our combinator experts and, um, and others. So, um, and by the way, I've, I've uh, since this event has been set up, I've been getting a, a big stream of interesting pointers from combinator experts saying, there's this interesting thing about combinators, that interesting thing. I'm not gonna mention all of these things, but hopefully people will have a chance to do that afterwards. So what's the big picture of combinators? I would say that the event that we're celebrating here was kind of the seed that we can see led to the idea of universal computation, uh, which has led to Basically, the possibility of computer technology, the idea of software, um, a lot of modern technology, and as we're now seeing, a lot of science that can be done, although that's something that's only emerging in, in very recent times. So it was a big deal. The, th the seed that was sown was a big deal. It was also very hard to understand. The things that were said probably at, at Moses Scheinfinkel's talk were probably understood by uh, the, the significance was understood by almost nobody at the time. Um, combinators have remained this kind of thing, which is a seed, an interesting thing, a footnote. Um, what I want to do here is, is tell you about combinators and about um, uh, their, um, why maybe they shouldn't be quite so much of a footnote. All right, let me go ahead and um, uh, first of all, okay, so this is the chap who, um, uh, gave that talk 100 years ago now, uh, Moses Scheinfinkel. This is a picture uh, of him taken probably in the year after um, that talk was given. And um, the, uh, the talk that he gave was entitled Elements of Logic or Elemental der Logik. I can't do the German, sorry. We're not going to get that level of authenticity here. Um, the, uh, uh, about four years later, paper appeared that was uh, a summary of that talk. And so maybe what I should do is start off telling you um, what that paper said, and then I'll tell you about uh, uh, what, what Moses Scheinfinkel introduced and uh, kind of how this all works. So as an English translation of the beginning of this paper, um, it is in the spirit of the axiomatic method as it has now received recognition, chiefly through the work of Hilbert, who might've been sitting in the front row, that uh, we not only strive to keep the axioms as few and their content as limited as possible, but also attempt to make the number of fundamental undefined notions as small as we can. We do this by seeking out those notions from which we shall best be able to construct all other notions of the branch of science in question. Well, so then he starts off and says, um, uh, as is well known, the fundamental propositional connectives of mathematical logic, which uh, we reproduce here in the notation of Hilbert are these. Um, so what he's doing here is to say, this is what people build logic out of, not or and implies, what is that one, equivalence. The, um, uh, 
So we're, we're used to the idea, and people knew it at the time, that logic can be built out of those kinds of uh, uh, primitive notions. What had happened, and what um, uh, Schoenfinkel goes on to say, um, that the reduction to a single fundamental connective is nevertheless entirely possible. Um, and this was discovered not long ago, he says, by Schaeffer. Actually, it was discovered before Schaeffer by Peirce and other people. But um, uh, what was it that was discovered? So we can represent standard logic by ands and ors and, and nots, but um, there's another possibility that was discovered. And that possibility um, is that we can also represent logic with a single operation, NAND, and what Schaeffer showed, and in fact, um, Schoenfinkel reproduces this result on the next page of his paper, is that using the single connective NAND, um, you can generate all of the standard operations of logic. So for example, AND is P NAND Q, NAND P NAND Q. And um, uh, the, then, um, uh, what's some other examples here? Implies is P NAND Q, NAND P, and so on. So in other words, we can take what we thought of as something that was a kind of the, the basics of logic and or not, and we can make it even simpler. We can represent logic in terms of just a single operation NAND. Okay, and so back in the day, uh, Henry Schaeffer had written uh, a paper about that. Um, and one might have said, who cares? This is, this is some very obscure feature of logic that it's possible to, um, uh, um, to reproduce some, um, uh, all of these logical uh, uh, expressions just in terms of NAND. You might say, who cares? And, and perhaps for, uh, for about 40 years or so after that was discovered, it was correct, who cares? Well, now there's uh, a quintillion versions of this that exist in the world because basically every piece of, um, every microprocessor, um, every uh, logic circuit is built uh, using metal oxide semiconductors, using NAND. So this thing that started as this obscure piece of mathematical logic, this obscure kind of reduction of logic into, uh, into just NAND, turned out to be extremely technologically significant. And as I say, there's now a quintillion NANDs that are probably running right at this moment around the world in, in computers. Okay, so that was sort of Schoenfinkel's uh, inspiration for what he did was the idea that uh, basic logic with ands and ors and nots could be reduced to just the single operation of NAND. So then he asks, um, he says, the successes we've encountered thus far um, encourage us to attempt further progress. We're led to the idea, which at first glance certainly appears extremely bold, of attempting to eliminate by suitable reduction the remaining fundamental notions. Those are propositions, propositional functions, and variables from all the contexts that we're dealing with. And uh, then he says, uh, oops, then, um, uh, then he goes on to say, and this is kind of the, um, uh, the big sentence of his paper. Let's go back to his, um, uh, his paper here. The big sentence, I think it's, uh, it appears on page two, if I can get this, yes, there we go, um, is, uh, um, is to say, that, uh, that's okay, um, is, uh, he says um, that uh, this reduction of removing all of these kinds of notions, he says, it's remarkable to me in the extreme that the goal we've just set of removing all of these uh, kinds of notions can be realized. Also, as it happens, it can be done by a reduction to three fundamental signs. So that was kind of the main thing that, that Schoenfinkel was talking about. Can you take all of these constructs that exist in defining uh, mathematics and mathematical logic and reduce them to something simpler as Schaeffer had reduced uh, standard logic to something simpler in the form of NAND? Okay, so um, uh, the, the, the question is, what did, what did Schoenfinkel actually do? So the basic idea that um, he started with was, we've got these expressions that appear in mathematical logic. They're things that say for all X, this is true, that's true, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How can we break that down? How can we find a uniform way to represent um, all of those kinds of uh, constructs? 
And what he realized is what we would now say uh, is, is that everything that you write like that can be written as a kind of symbolic expression. At the time, he didn't have kind of the language to describe that, but that's basically what he was saying. So in modern times, what we would say is something like, uh, you know, we have some, some simple piece of, um, some piece of, uh, let's say, some, some mathematical kind of thing, and we know that in fact, we can represent that thing, which looks like a piece of math in some very uniform way, just saying it's power of X and two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, a plus. Or we could say we could represent that whole thing as, um, uh, as a tree where we're just saying there's a plus at the top and then there's some powers that represent these kinds of things. And so what Schoenfinkel's first big sort of realization was everything you can write down as a kind of mathematical expression or a statement in mathematical logic can be, can be represented in this kind of way that we would now say it's like a symbolic expression. And in a sense, what he was, and then what he said was, okay, we've got this thing, but there are things here like power and plus and so on. Uh, those are things that in a sense are, are just features of, of uh, the way that we are giving meaning to this kind of construct. But there's a raw construct. There's just the pure tree that exists here. It's a little bit like in ordinary logic when we say P and Q, and that's kind of a symbolic P and a symbolic Q. Later on, we're going to say P means it's raining today. Q means um, I have an umbrella and so on. We're going to give meaning to these things by sort of feeding that in from the outside. But what we have at the beginning is just the pure structure. So what he realized, and it was kind of a, a big thing to realize, um, is that you could represent all of these kind of mathematical uh, statements in the form of what we would now call symbolic expressions. And those symbolic expressions could be uh, represented in some sort of raw form just in terms of structure, in terms of some kind of tree-like structure. Um, and then from the outside would come all the things that you would feed in, like the pluses and powers and twos and so on, that would give meaning to it. Okay, so then what did he actually invent? Well, so he invented these things, these combinators, and um, we can write them out in modern form here. And uh, it's um, the fact that it's really easy to write these things out in Wolfram language is, uh, is kind of might be a clue as to why, uh, why I've been interested in these things for a long time. Um, but this is, that's, that's what uh, Schoenfenkel came up with, the S combinator and the K combinator. What are these things? These things can be thought of as kind of uh, uh, tree representing kinds of constructs. Okay, how does that work? Well, let's say we have, um, let's say we have something like this. We have, we make up a big collection of S's and K's, there it is. Um, this on its own does, does absolutely nothing. But what we can say is let's imagine that we just feed in some specific variables here, let's say A, B, and C. And we just say, let's use these rules that we have for the, that define uh, what S with, uh, with three things after it and K with two things after it mean. Let's just use those rules and see what happens. Okay, so we got out of that, this A of B of A of C, we can say what's the tree form of that. What we did, oh, that wasn't very exciting, I should have done it a different way, but anyway, the, 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 um, uh, what we did there was we constructed this expression. What we've got is this kind of raw combinator object that basically says, given that you feed in these particular objects, construct something like this. So that was kind of the big idea that just from those uh, kind of primitives, you could construct anything. Now, uh, how does this actually work? Well, um, it's uh, a little bit hard to see what's going on here. Let me try and show you um, a, a better picture of that. Okay, so here's, a, here's another version of that. Um, oops, move this out of the way. Um, here's another version of that showing the series of reductions that are being made each time applying one of those S rules or the K rule. Here's a slightly, slightly better version of that. Every time there's a red thing here, it's applying the S rule, uh, a blue thing, it's applying the K rule. We start off from that thing at the beginning and we end up, oops, we end up at the end uh, with the result that we wanted there. So the very, it's, it's, it's a very bizarre thing that we can break down any of these kind of uh, tree construction operations just into some combination of S's and K's. Okay, so, uh, but, but so what? What can, what can we really do with this? Well, the thing that Schoenfinkel realized um, 
is that you can use this uh, to essentially, as we would now say, compute things. What can you compute? Well, for instance, one thing you can compute is uh, the operations of ordinary logic. You can say, um, let's say I'm feeding in a couple of variables um, uh, that um, I, I want to, and I want to generate and, you can say, let me create a combinator expression that will do that. Now, in order to do this, we have to do something else, which is we have to say, how are we going to represent uh, true and false just in terms of combinators? How are we going to uh, start representing everything in terms of combinators? Today, it's not quite as surprising we can do this because we're used to kind of the idea of computation and the idea that we have computers and we can represent everything as a kind of, uh, uh, as, as a sort of computational structure um, inside a computer. But then it was, I think, not obvious at all. Um, but in this particular case, we can say, let's take, um, let's take uh, true to be, oh, that's a bizarre form of true, that's not right. Um, the, uh, that's not right either. Something something went wrong with this. I should regenerate this. Um, let's try, take uh, uh, false to be just uh, to be s of k and true to be k. Then these things here. And I thought that this was generated correctly. This should be the minimum. Uh, no, these are these are wrong. Um, well, we can redo it. Um, but uh, the, the, these uh, should be the minimal expressions you need with um, uh, with um, uh, S of K of true is true and K is false, um, of being able to generate, being able to basically compute the operations of Boolean algebra. So the question is, what else can you compute this way? Well, for instance, um, another thing you can compute, let me pull that up, um, is uh, let's say you want to do arithmetic. Well, then you have to have some representation for numbers. And one way you can represent numbers is basically just by nested um, S of S of S of S of S, um, N times to represent the number N. And if you do that, you can again, um, uh, you can again, let me see here. Um, you should be able to again um, uh, generate, um, have this here. Um, you should be able to generate. So, let, like, like, say, for example, this is um, um, this is what you can get when if you want to. Um, um, oops. There we go. Um, let's say you are going to. Um, um, uh, this is the addition of uh, one and two, where those things are represented by nested collections of combinators. Or for example, it gets a bit more complicated. You can go and you can do the same kind of thing. You can make a combinator that in that representation of numbers does multiplication. So there's uh, that's the combinator that does that. And then you can say, um, this is this is the series of steps that you get by using that reduction rule for doing multiplication of three by two. So this looks like kind of a crazy way to do things, but the most important thing is that you can go and compute. Uh, you can you can compute any kind of thing in this way. So for example, there's uh, there's the computation of power. There's the combinator for computing power with that representation of numbers and so on. And if we go on, uh, we can get to um, uh, here's a combinator that represents a single step in the evolution of uh, uh, the rule 110 cellular automaton, which we know, we know is computation universal. So if nothing else, having this combinator, it's a big, complicated, messy thing. This is a program written in combinators that reproduces uh, the rule 110 cellular automaton. And we can go ahead if we want to, uh, we could run it. Um, that's just a picture of um, uh, from my new kind of science book from, from uh, 18 years ago now. Of, um, of that combinator running to, uh, to do the operations of the rule 110 cellular automaton. Okay, so that, that's kind of the idea of combinators. Uh, we've got these two operations, these two things, S and K, we combine them. That's our kind of low level machine code. With that low level machine code, we're able to create uh, things that will be able to construct any symbolic expression and then do in the end, any computation.
it wasn't obvious at the time that Schoenfinkel was around what on earth it might mean to do any computation. What he imagined was he was just trying to reproduce the, the objects in mathematical logic. Okay, but given that we have this idea of these S and K combinators, we can ask, uh, what do these things do? If you, just, if you just look at them kind of in the wild, you just look at S and K combinators on their own, what do they, what do they typically do? Well, so we can, we can enumerate um, uh, possible combinator expressions. Those are ones with, um, with, three, um, um, with three elements. And we can say, what do these do? Um, well, first thing we can do is just run them and see what happens. And uh, what we find is that, um, that this is what happens with um, a few of those, um, those expressions. Uh, we just see after, after a few steps, they end up at a fixed point uh, where they just have some, some collection of combinators to which the combinator rules no longer apply, things just stop. We can just figure out, okay, that's the distribution of essentially halting times of how long it takes this combinator reduction to stop. Um, the, uh, uh, so, but by the way, I just want to say that, that what I want to do here is I'm gonna talk a bit about kind of combinators in the wild, combinators um, and how they, how they behave. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the context of combinators um, in terms of the history of mathematics and computation. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, Moses Scheinfinkel himself and what we now know, uh, the things we've now pieced together actually just in the last uh, few weeks or a month um, about Moses Scheinfinkel. So, okay, first question is, what do combinators do in the wild? And uh, uh, the answer is, most combinators in the wild um, just run for a little while and then halt. Uh, by the way, for combinator experts, I, what I'm talking about right now is mostly leftmost, outermost evaluation. Um, I'll talk about other things later. So that's the halting time distribution, I think, for size six combinator expressions. But then what happens is, as we get to, uh, uh, we can ask, well, what, what, what else can happen here? Okay, so the first really surprising thing that happens is when we get to um, uh, size seven, we find this combinator expression here. And um, if we try running it, what happens? Well, the answer is it, no, it never goes to a fixed point. Instead, um, we just get bigger and bigger and bigger combinator objects. So here, here's the plot of what happens as a function of number of steps this is the size of that S combinator expression as a function of number of steps. So this is the first non-halting combinator expression. So we, but most of the time we just say, okay, we're doing these combinators, they're doing computation, they get a result, that's the end of it. But when we get to the size seven one, for the first time we have one that doesn't halt. And if we look, what does this do? Let's look at, let's say the ratios of, um, uh, of successive sizes on successive steps. And it's pretty weird that something as simple as the thing I just showed can make something that complicated, but we haven't kind of seen anything yet. Um, if we look at, uh, well, that, that's the distribution of halting times for the ones that do halt, we can keep going. We can say, what's the, um, uh, what's, the, um, uh, what's the distribution of the time it takes for the combinator to halt versus the size of object that it builds versus the size of symbolic expression that the combinator builds, that's the result. So, so for example, here, there's an expression that uh, takes, uh, takes a certain number of steps to halt, but these all come from, I think these are all size um, seven combinator expressions. Um, this is a tiny little combinator expression, but it builds a pretty big thing here. So, um, oh, I guess I don't have the examples here with them. Uh, oh, maybe I have some. Um, okay, so this is, uh, um, that's a typical example of what happens. That's a, that's a tiny, I think that's a size seven combinator expression. Unfortunately, I didn't label it properly here. Um, but um, uh, this starts, starts from that size, it runs for some number of steps, and then it halts at that size there. Uh, here's another example. This is now running uh, for what, 50 something steps. That's the combinator expression, and then it halts. Uh, there's another one, runs for a few more steps, then it halts. Sometimes it, these things can run for quite a while. That's one, for, one that runs for 300 and something steps before it halts. And again, uh, it's, all of these are very tiny programs doing rather complicated things. 
Sometimes you get nice nested patterns. Here's one that produces a, um, uh, a nested looking pattern. That one halts after, uh, that one halts after 21,720 steps. Um, sometimes you get uh, something that's more like growth. That's one that shows very regular growth. It just grows like square root of time, uh, square root of number of steps. But if you look, for example, this is the collection of um, uh, different kinds of things that can happen with size eight combinator expressions, just looking at the, uh, the ratio of the successive sizes. So it's kind of remarkable that you might think it's kind of remarkable that something this tiny could produce uh, so much complexity in its behavior. Well, you can keep going. You can look at all kinds of different things. Sometimes they look like they're gonna do complicated things for a while and then they get simple again. Um, here's one that uh, uh, goes for, how long does this one go for? Um, this one, um, this one I think goes forever. Um, if you look at uh, what what is it doing, it's uh, it's producing something that's kind of like a uh, like an integer exponent function, counting the number of uh, uh, counting the number of zeros and a number and so on. Anyway, you keep going, you see all kinds of different things happen. Um, sometimes uh, uh, it looks as if one's going to get really uh, sort of complicated random behavior, but after a while things stabilize and, and um, all looks good. Um, sometimes you get, um, uh, sometimes you, you can ask the question, can, can you kind of tell what's going to happen um, in these combinators? And sometimes it's, it's really hard. Like let's say here's one, this is, uh, this is just a size, um, uh, this is a size nine combinator expression. That's it running for 10,000 steps. We can keep it going, that's it running for Oh, sorry, that, that's, uh, that was a different one, sorry. This is one running for a, a thousand steps, same size. Um, the question is, what is this going to do? Let's run it now for 10,000 steps, that's what it does. Okay, we say, what's, what's going to happen next? Um, that's what it does. Uh, we keep running it, we keep running it. Um, there it is for 100,000 steps, still not clear what it's going to do. Um, uh, there it is finally for um, uh, 100 million steps, and it turns out this particular combinator expression after, um, 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 after uh, 137,356,329 steps uh, finally stops. So, so this is something where if we were going to try to predict what this, what this is going to do, we would realize that this is very difficult. Um, and this is kind of a, a sign of a feature of combinators that they're capable of doing universal computation. And what we're seeing is kind of a, uh, the, the sign of undecidability, the sign of the, the undecidability of the halting problem for, for combinators. Well, one thing I might say is, should it surprise us that these very simple rules uh, can produce such complicated behavior? Should it surprise us and should we care? Um, we might say, why did we build combinators? We built combinators to do useful mathematical logic. We built combinators to um, uh, uh, to, to do computations that um, uh, that we kind of care about setting up. Um, why should uh, uh, why do we care about what combinators in the wild do? Why do we care about this kind of natural history of combinators? Well, it's not clear that in the past one would particularly have cared. Um, my own efforts actually probably tell one a reason one might care. Um, basically, the, the, the question that I started thinking about maybe 40 something years ago is the question of if you want to make models of things that happen, for example, in nature, what is the right raw material to make those models out of? And we've had for about 300 years, we had kind of the mathematical equations approach to having a way to make models for things. And that approach was obviously very successful. But the question was, particularly when we see really complicated phenomena, for example, in nature, the question is, what is the right raw material from which to make models of those kinds of things? And what I kind of realized is, actually, we want to be more general than just using mathematical equations. We want to use sort of arbitrary kinds of rules to represent the kinds of things that nature potentially can do to do the kind, produce the kinds of behavior it does. And so, uh, that that um, uh, got me into thinking, well, how would we represent those kinds of rules? Well, the obvious thing to do is use programs. Then the question is, okay, so what kinds of programs might nature be using to produce the kind of behavior it produces? And so that got me into many years of, um, 
of kind of study of these kinds of things, I was sort of lucky in that the first type of systems that I studied along these lines were cellular automata, one dimensional cellular automata, where the state of the system is represented just by a line of black and white cells. And all you're doing is saying, here's, a, here's the rule for the system. And then you're saying, how does the system produce its behavior based on that rule? And these systems have the nice feature that you can kind of visually immediately see what's going on. And so I did a bunch of computer experiments long ago uh, to find out when you have these very simple rules for, in this case, one dimensional cellular automata, what do they actually do? And my first assumption was, if the rule is sufficiently simple, the behavior is going to be somehow correspondingly simple. But then, you know, you start seeing examples like this, you keep running it a bit longer, you get things like that. But then kind of the big thing is you run, uh, kind of you just run uh, all possible rules of that, that uh, simple type that I was showing you. And this is kind of my, my all time favorite science discovery is this thing that uh, I call rule 30, which is just this very simple rule for a cellular automaton. You started off from just one black cell at the top here, and this is what it makes. Keep running it a bit longer, this is what you get. There's a certain amount of regularity over on the left, but for many practical purposes, um, this seems to be producing uh, c quite random behavior. In fact, the center column here is a really good random number generator that we've used for many years. So the big surprise is, contrary to what one's intuition might suggest, even things with very simple rules that you might sort of just pick at random can produce incredibly complicated behavior. Why is that important? Well, one reason it's important is because what we see in nature is the same kind of thing, that even though in many cases we know that the rules for systems are quite simple, the behavior those systems produce is very complicated. And there's sort of been this question, what's the sort of secret that nature is using to make all that complexity? And I think we now know what that is. It's basically that in this sort of computational universe of possible programs, um, that it's actually very easy to have even very simple programs produce behavior of great complexity. Now, we hadn't really seen that for two reasons. One, because when we do engineering, we want to set things up so that the thing we build will be something whose behavior we can readily foresee. That's often been the point of engineering. That's one reason. The other reason is that with the methods of mathematics and things like this, we tended to concentrate, for example, not on the randomness of the primes, but rather on those features of the distribution of primes that our mathematical methods and theorems and so on could attack. And so this kind of, let's look at the sort of raw complexity of what can happen, even with simple rules, wasn't something that people had studied but it's something that's out there and it's something that's really important if one wants to understand things like the natural world. Actually, a thing that's, that's been really significant to me to see over the past probably 20 years or so, this transition from something where for, for like 300 years, when people made models of things, they basically turned to equations to do that. In probably the last couple of decades, when people have made new models of things, they don't turn to equations, they typically turn to programs and they make their models using programs. And what we're studying here is kind of the basic science of, of, that, uh, of that process, of what is the basic science of what sort of programs out in the computational universe actually do. And, and so there's, there's a lot to understand there, and there are some general principles about what programs out in the computational universe typically do. The biggest is this thing I call the principle of computational equivalence, which is kind of a, an intuitive principle, a bit like the second law of thermodynamics to which it is deeply related, um, that, uh, to it, which it actually implies. Um, the, uh, uh, it kind of gives us a sort of guiding principle for understanding what happens in the computational universe. And, and one of the, um, uh, but one of the things that, why am I talking about all of this? Well, the reason I'm talking about all of this is because combinators are, and in a sense were, a fantastic example of this phenomenon. Um, the combinators, even though uh, all these things that I was showing you about kind of the zoology of combinators, um, that's, that's really the story of how in the computational universe of simple programs, how you can get uh, extreme complexity of behavior. Now, what we found most recently is having realized that yes, it's possible to go from extremely simple programs to uh, very complicated behavior, kind of the, uh, the big thing that one might think about then is, well, what about our whole physical universe, for example? Um, is it conceivable that uh, somehow 
the um, the structure of our whole physical universe is just a um, uh, a feature of of some very simple rules like that. Um, and indeed, uh, rather excitingly, just in this past year, we've discovered that yes, actually, it it really is true that in a sense, uh, something which um, uh, that it's possible to understand what sort of underneath space and time and so on, to actually sort of find the machine code for the universe. And it's it's really quite a remarkable thing. And it's something where going this sort of notion that one can have a simple program and have it actually uh, show behavior that um, uh, is sort of as complicated as anything. We now really know that that's the case because we really can understand how that works in physics. And the thing that's remarkable is that from just these very simple programs, we've discovered that it's possible to reproduce the sort of, particularly the two main theories of 20th century physics, general relativity and quantum mechanics. Now, one of the things that, um, uh, that is sort of surprising about physics is that it's sort of possible to do physics. It might be the case that you would look at something like that rule 30 cellular automaton and you would say, um, gosh, it's very hard to predict what that's going to do. Um, and uh, in fact, that principle of computational equivalence that I mentioned implies this phenomenon of computational irreducibility that basically says to know what this is going to do, you pretty much have no choice. You can't do something much more efficient than just running it and seeing what will happen. You can't kind of do what traditional equations-based science um, has considered so valuable to sort of jump ahead and compress the sort of computational effort of figuring out what this is going to do. So one big question about physics is, um, okay, uh, how come we can do physics at all? How come the universe doesn't just seem to us this incoherent mess of computational irreducibility? And I have to say that when I started thinking about how the physics might be based on very simple programs, that's kind of what I assumed was going to happen, that we would only be able to figure out what the first 10 to the minus 1,000 seconds in the behavior of the universe were and so on. But it turns out that that isn't the case. It turns out that within this kind of... Uh, uh, computational irreducibility, there are these kind of slices of computational reducibility. There are these ways in which, even though the structure that we get um, uh, at, at the lowest level is has this whole feature of computational irreducibility, there are ways to kind of take slices of that that are, that, uh, are easier to understand. And it turns out the two big slices we can take are relativity and quantum mechanics, and they're deeply related to each other. In fact, in some sense, they're the same theory. Now, uh, why am I telling you this? Well, uh, the, the theory that we have for physics is not combinators, um, but the theory we have for physics is deeply related to a lot of the kinds of things that we can understand from combinators. And a lot of the mathematical development of combinators and things that came from them are the things which in the end give us things like the validity of relativity, uh, features of quantum measurement, all those kinds of things. So things that come out of the theory of term rewriting, uh, theory of, of uh, um, all sorts of things related to combinators turn out now to have a big application. And the big application is kind of the biggest thing we have, our universe actually understanding fundamental physics. Um, I might just mention that uh, when we talk about combinators, we can think about combinators as being, um, uh, how, how do we think about a combinator? Well, a combinator is this uh, symbolic expression, and we can kind of represent that symbolic expression um, as, as a tree like this. So this is, uh, this is just like I was showing those expressions from Wolfram Language at the beginning. This is just a combinator expression shown as a tree. And so when we think about the evolution of combinators, what we're essentially doing is thinking about the evolution of trees. What we've got with combinators are um, uh, we've got these rules that uh, it's a bug there. Um, we've got these rules that um, uh, basically tell us how to rewrite pieces of trees. And so, whenever we're looking at one of these pieces of combinator evolution, we can think of them as being a process of rewriting trees. Well, when we in our models of physics, what happens is that um, we have something very similar, not quite the same, very similar that's happening. Instead of thinking about trees, we're thinking about um, hypergraphs. Um, and, and what we're imagining is that, what is our universe made of? Our universe, well, since Euclid, people have sort of assumed that our universe is just, just has space in it and things can be placed in space. But what we're thinking about in our model of physics 
is what's underneath that? What is space itself made of? It's kind of like you could ask what's a material like water made of? And you would realize that in the end, water is, is not just this continuous fluid that you might think it was, but instead it's made of discrete molecules. And so what we imagine is that the same kind of thing is true of space and that ultimately there are these kind of atoms of space. And these atoms of space, they have no characteristics other than that they exist and they're just these sort of points in space. And the only thing we know about them is how they're related to other points. And so instead of drawing a tree, we're going to draw a graph or a hypergraph. And instead of having one of those combinator relations, we're going to have a relation that says, this is how we're going to rewrite pieces of that hypergraph. OK, so if we do that, um, let's say we start with a hypergraph that looks like this, and we rewrite it a bit, um, we will get something that looks like this. We keep going for a while, we'll get something that looks like this. It's very much the same kind of thing that we saw in cellular automata. It's very much the same kind of thing that we saw in combinators. Um, but now it happens to be in hypergraphs. Uh, what happens with these hypergraphs? Well, you can get all kinds of exotic things produced. Uh, but one of the things that happens is, here's an example of one that kind of knits the structure. You look at that structure, that structure is like a two-dimensional grid. So essentially, this thing is knitting something like two-dimensional space. And so it turns out you can have um, other rewriting rules that knit things like um, uh, curved space and so on. And the big thing is that just like you can go from kind of the discrete behavior of molecules in water, you can kind of zoom up to see what the fluid equations are for, for water as a continuous fluid. So you can do the same kind of thing from these underlying models. You can find out what is the kind of zoomed up version, um, what, uh, uh, what's the kind of large scale structure of a system like this when it has perhaps 10 to the 400 points in it. And the answer is at the, uh, that, it, uh, the, the remarkable answer is that it is exactly Einstein's equations, that it exactly gives us the standard equations for space-time um, that come from, uh, quite generically, from the kind of large-scale behavior of these kinds of systems. M much like in, in, in fluid dynamics, it ultimately doesn't matter that much what the underlying molecules are like. The large-scale behavior is always the same. That's actually a consequence also of this computational irreducibility phenomenon that I mentioned earlier. All right, well, let me talk, not talk in detail about physics, but let me just say that's by way of motivation of why even more than before, I care about combinators now, because it turns out that the ideas that came from combinators are deeply related to the kinds of things one needs in physics. Okay, so one of the things about to say about combinators, and we can, we can represent these combinators in all sorts of ways. We can kind of make them look a bit like a cellular automaton here, um, just uh, writing out their Ks and Ss and so on like that. We can make um, nice uh, 3D pictures of them that show kind of the, uh, uh, the, the size of the combinator as a function of, of uh, number of steps and so on. We can do all kinds of things like that. Um, it's pretty hard to understand how combinators work. This is a picture showing the size of a combinator expression uh, and that's showing where the combinator expression got rewritten, where the actual update rule that said S of X, Y, Z goes to whatever um, was applied. Okay, well now let me, let me uh, add even more complexity to this situation. So the issue is um, where, where are the updates actually gonna get applied? By the way, in, in terms of, of, of looking at sort of how combinators behave, another thing one can do is one can say, well, when we build these trees, they're kind of inefficient. Because in a sense, a lot of subtrees are the same in these trees. And so in sort of a computer science way, we can turn that into a DAG. Um, and we can ask, what is the evolution of combinators in terms of DAGs? And you get things like this. And no, it's not easier to understand what's going on in terms of these DAGs where we kind of share, shared all possible common sub-expressions than it is in the, in the original tree form. At least it isn't easier for me. OK, well, so the next big question is, if your if you have a combinator expression, um, let's say you have this expression here, you can see that there are a variety of places. The, the, the red pieces here mark where the S rule applies. The blue pieces mark where the K rule applies. So one of the features of this is there are multiple different places where these rules can apply. So one of the questions is if you're given a combinator expression, you're told, what does this combinator expression turn into? How does it evolve? What you realize is that um, uh, that, that uh, there are many possible ways that you can go. There are many possible paths you can take. And in fact, there's a whole, uh, you, you, can, you can start characterizing those different possible ways. Um, so for example, and, and one feature, um, one important fact is that if the combinator expression is going to terminate, then it doesn't matter what path you followed. 
you'll always get the same result. So uh, the, the, there are a variety of different, you can, you can um, uh, think about a variety of different evaluation rules that you can use. Uh, here are some examples of different, different kinds of rules you can use for what do you evaluate first. I have to say that as a designer of computational languages, I've been very interested in trying to see whether one can parametrize these kinds of evaluation orders in a way that's actually useful for people. I tried back in my system called SMP back in, in the uh, 1979, I tried to make a sort of parameterization of this. I don't think anybody, including me, ever understood how to use that parameterization. In Wolfram language, we end up with just basically two cases. Either you take, uh, you evaluate things by going to the innermost, innermost, innermost depth first thing first, or you hold the arguments of a function and you kind of evaluate everything in one gulp, which is essentially leftmost, outermost. Um, but there are a variety of different kinds of possible evaluation orders that you can use. Okay, let me, again, why do we care? Well, there's, an, uh, there's a lot of importance to this in the theory of combinators, but for physics, there's a very good reason we care. This business about being able to take all these possible paths, that is quantum mechanics. Um, the, uh, the version that we understood in, in combinators is a very early version of that, but it's the same phenomenon as the phenomenon that leads to quantum mechanics. Um, in classical mechanics, we kind of have this idea that sort of definite things happen. There's a definite path that things follow. In quantum mechanics, we have the idea that sort of all possible paths are followed and we only get to know certain amplitudes of different things that happen. Well, the reason that happens is because in our hypergraphs, for example, just like in combinators, there are many possible evaluation orders. There are many possible different updates that can be made. And in a sense, we're following all those possible updates. And one of the big mysteries of quantum mechanics is, so if there are all these possible things that can happen, why do any of us think that any definite things happen at all? Well, the answer turns out to be the same reason that when you evaluate combinator expressions, it doesn't matter what path you follow. If they terminate, at least you'll always get the same answer. That's that phenomenon is the same phenomenon as the phenomenon that leads to essentially objective reality in quantum mechanics. It also happens to be the same phenomenon that leads to relativistic invariance, that leads to the fact that you kind of uh, experience the same physics regardless of what reference frame you're in in space time. Okay, let's see how we can understand some of that. So one of the questions is, if we have a combinator expression and we say, let, we can rewrite that combinator expression in a variety of different ways. We can choose a different, uh, a different place, a different match for the rules and use those different possible matches. So this is now a graph that we can get. We call these multi-way graphs that show uh, what the possible uh, rewrites can be. And in this particular case, what we're seeing is we start off with this combinator expression here. There are two possible rewrites at the beginning. There are various different things that happen, but all paths lead to the same result. They all lead to the same fixed point. Um, they're all, and this is, and, and so the key fact here, the so-called church russell property or confluence um, is um, that whenever there's a branch, there's also a merge. Now there's a generalization of that that we call causal invariance, which is relevant for things like the universe. The universe, so far as we know, doesn't halt. Um, it doesn't stop, it doesn't get to a final result. It doesn't say the answer is 42 or anything. Um, it just keeps going. And so it's a little bit more subtle what happens. And I will tell you, and this is kind of a, the, the big homework for some of the perhaps combinator experts here is we don't quite know what the correct analog of causal invariance as we have formulated it for hypergraphs and stringary right systems is for combinators. There undoubtedly is one, but we haven't got it quite right yet. Um, the, uh, okay, so what happens with these, with these combinator expressions? Well, let me, let's take a look here. So this is, um, this is for example, a particular combinator expression um, and it's just showing the size of the combinator expression. And it's showing, eventually it reaches a fixed point. This is a multi-way graph that I'm showing here. Um, and this particular path, this orange path, is probably the leftmost outermost evaluation strategy, um, which gives that result. Um, but if we pick different strategies, so there's, a, there's another example, we're showing that's a size seven combinator expression. Eventually it ends up with a size 40 result. And this is a particular evaluation order, a particular path through this multi-way graph, a particular quantum history effectively. So we can keep going. We can get much bigger versions of this. Um, oops, that's, um, uh, we, can, we can look at. So these are sort of typical uh, multi-way graphs um, one thing we find is that um, 
in, in combinators, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, if they're going to come to a fixed point, there'll always be just one fixed point. But sometimes there'll be a combinator expression where there can be a fixed point with some evaluation order, that leftmost outermost evaluation order will, will always find the fixed point if there is a fixed point. But there can also be ways to kind of get lost and just start generating bigger and bigger and bigger combinator expressions and never reach the fixed point. And you see that in the case of this multi-way graph by these, these uh, orange things here are the things that are kind of still active. There's the fixed point down there that many paths reach, but some do not, and they kind of go and get lost. Now for the universe, um, uh, not getting lost, getting lost is a very good thing because it means the universe keeps going. These fixed points, what do they correspond to in the universe? They correspond to space-like singularities in general relativity. They correspond to what happens at the center of, for example, a Schwarzschild black hole where time basically stops, where all paths, if you're sucked into that black hole, all paths lead you to the singularity where basically time stops. The stopping of time corresponds to the, the arrival at a fixed point in uh, a multi-way graph, a multi-way graph for hypergraphs rather than a multi-way graph for, for combinator expressions, but they basically look the same. So that, that's kind of the um, uh, a thing that we see in um, uh, um, that, that's that's one of the kinds of uh, interesting features. And, um, and as I say, this idea of multi-way graphs um, is um, uh, is something that uh, has been actually rediscovered in many different fields. Um, in the in the study of combinators, is usually called Bohm trees. Um, I think they're called Bohm trees at least. Um, but uh, although I had some mail this morning. Uh, from uh, saying that maybe I'm wrong calling them that, but but okay, the, these are multi-way graphs, at least as far as I'm concerned. Um, okay, well we can ask questions about um, uh, so so uh, one of the things we can do when we look at these multi-way graphs, one of the things that we learn from physics um, is the idea that one of the things that's important is not just to look at uh, the kind of which combinator expression leads to what combinator expression, but also what the updating events were that led from one combinator expression to another. And in particular, here we're showing these are the actual updates that led from one expression to another. So there's an important question we can ask about those updates. And the question is, what is the causal dependence? What is the causal relationship between those updates? Why is that important? It's important because in physics, uh, we observers are embedded inside the universe. We don't get to see the universe from the outside. We don't get to see all the kind of states of the universe from the outside. All we get to do is to say, we know what's happening to us. We can look out at the rest of the universe and we can sort of compare what's happening there to what's happening with us. And what that turns into is the statement that the only thing we are ever going to be sensitive to is the network of causal relationships between, uh, between things in the universe. And so what happens is in this case of this combinator, uh, evolution, what we're saying is what really matters is these updating events and the causal relationship between these updating events. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that the when we do one of these updating events, in order to do one up, an updating event, that certain inputs need to exist to, uh, to allow that updating event to occur. And we can kind of trace what inputs need to exist for that updating event to occur. So for example, let's let's look at Let's look at this. This is a string rewriting system, simpler than combinators. We're just saying there's a sequence of A's and B's, um, and we're just saying there's a particular rule that says how to rewrite um, how to rewrite the string based on saying, what does it say? It says BB goes to A, and it says A goes to BBB. And we're just using that here. And these yellow areas are the updating events that are applied to this, to this string. Okay, so what we can ask now is for this updating event here to be done, it has to be the case that this updating event here has already happened. No, this updating event here has already happened because we need that B there. So what this is, we can think of this as like these updating events are like running, uh, applying functions. And we need the input for a function to have been provided for the output from a previous function in order for that function to run. So we can essentially build a causal graph that represents the causal relationships between those updating events. Okay, so here's the causal graph for that particular case. Um, now, big fact, as soon as there is this property that paths converge, this causal invariance property, it implies that this causal network of which updating event depends on which updating event, you always get isomorphic causal, you always get the same causal graph. 
it doesn't matter what the microscopic updating order that you use is, you'll always get the same causal graph. And uh, why does that matter? Well, uh, one reason that matters, let me show you an example here, is um, we, can, uh, uh, we can look at, let's say, here's a string writing system. This is just one that sorts uh, BA goes to AB. Um, but we can say, let's do this, these updatings in a different order. Let's effectively pick a different reference frame, a different way of sampling uh, the, the, what can happen in the system. Well, what does picking that difference reference frame mean? We're, we're basically picking a different kind of uh, foliation of this, uh, we're picking a different choice of what we mean by successive moments in time in the system. And it turns out that by picking that different reference frame here, we're essentially doing a boost to relativistic transformation. And in fact, what we'll find even in the stringly writing system is that we will get Lorentz transformation. We'll, get, we'll find out that the stringly writing system obeys special relativity. Uh, it's a consequence of causal invariance that you get special relativity, that the reference frame, that the order of updating events that you use, essentially the evaluation order you use, uh, the fact that the evaluation order doesn't matter is the same statement as the fact that the relativistic reference frame you use doesn't matter. It's also the same statement as the different quantum measurement approaches you can use uh, give you the same result. Or in other words, that there is an objective reality in quantum mechanics. So, so that's the... Um, uh, that, that's, so that's what it means to that. That's why we might care about looking at this kind of network of causal relationships between updating events in combinators. And uh, I'll just show you one or two things there. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, this is that's that's a a typical um, uh, that's a typical causal graph that represents the uh, causal relationships between updating events in combinator expressions. Um, this is actually a multi-way causal graph. So on top of that multi-way system that shows uh, all the different possible branching paths for combinator evolution, this is showing the causal relationships between all of those paths. And things get really quite complicated um, quite quickly. Um, but the main point is that there's a representation of, um, uh, of these combinator evolutions in terms of causal graphs just as there's a representation of the evolution of the physical universe in terms of causal graphs, that turns out to be the representation that we are sensitive to. And the fact that that's what we're sensitive to is what leads to relativity in quantum mechanics. Um, now we can ask questions about in, in uh, so, so you might ask, what's the detailed analogy between uh, combinators and physics? Well, in physics, we can think about different events that happen and their relationships. So for example, there are time-like rela uh, related events. There are time-like separated events. What does that mean? It means one event happens and that event in time can lead to another event. That's sort of a, a simple uh, causal relationship between events. Another possibility in physics is that our events are space-like separated. That means that we can essentially foliate this, um, the causal graph in such a way that we say that those two events are happening uh, simultaneously in time. So that, that's saying that we've got this causal graph and um, uh, we're drawing these foliations where the, the, the causal graph defines a partial order between events. It says what events have to have happened before some other event can happen. But what this is saying is there's a way of picking our notion of how time runs so that these events can be considered to happen simultaneously. These events can be considered to be laid out in space rather than in time. They're space-like separated. There doesn't seem to be a good analog of that in, in combinators, although maybe we just haven't found it. But that's a very important thing for the universe, that it's possible to have space-like separated events, that it's possible to have a meaningful notion of space. Okay, there's another type of event. There's another type of separation, and that's what happens in the multi-way graph. In the multi-way graph, okay, here's a multi-way graph with some foliations here. Um, this one is sort of representing, this is a string rewrite system, this is kind of representing what happens in quantum mechanics with quantum observation frames. Um, but uh, what, what um, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a second kind of separation between things. And that second kind of separation is what we can call branch-like separation. It's a separation where those things occur on different branches in the multi-way system. Okay, so, so what is branch-like separation? Branch-like separation is another kind of way that things in the universe can be separated from, from each other. 
And that kind of way is just like when we lay things out, we can think of things being laid out in, in, in time, in space. We can also think about things being laid out in what we call branchial space, in the space of possible branches. And that branchial space is kind of the slice across the multiway graph. And that branchial space, I thought I had some pictures. Oh dear, where did they go? Um, uh, yes, here we go. Um, that branchial space is we take a multiway graph and we foliate the multiway graph. There are a variety of different foliations we can use. Those correspond to different relativistic reference frames or different quantum observation frames, different choices of quantum measurements. But in any case, we can take slices across here and we can ask how are these event, how are these uh, uh, states here related when, uh, by, by looking at, uh, for example, their common ancestry in this multi-way graph. And so we can essentially draw the, the notion, and, and this is being drawn now for combinators, this is shown, showing in a sense the branchial space of combinator expressions. This is showing how related are combinator expressions in a particular reference frame with respect to this multi-way graph. And things get quite complicated quite quickly, but this is this is branchial space. Um, this branchial space for combinators. We can draw branchial space also for the physical universe. Branchial space for the physical universe represents kind of a distribution of quantum states. This is showing essentially a map of the entanglement of quantum states in the case of the physical universe. Um, and so there are all kinds of interesting phenomena, like just as there's a speed of light, which is a maximum speed in, in space, there's also a maximum entanglement speed in branchial space and so on. And, and sort of one of the big results of our physics project is that uh, when we look in physical space at GD6, at shortest paths in physical space, the, the equations that govern kind of the, the, uh, the paths of GD6 are the Einstein equations. And basically they say a GD6 is deflected by the presence of energy. Um, in the universe. So geodesic is deflected by the presence of energy or mass, and that's the force of gravity that's deflecting that geodesic. And so that's, that comes out in our models uh, from uh, in, in when we're just looking at ordinary space and at ordinary space derived from causal graphs and so on. What's the analog in branchial space? Okay, so we can also look at GD6 in the multiway graph. We can look at GD6, we can look at the paths of GD6 in branchial space. And so one of the things that's kind of my favorite fact so far from our physics project is that the equations that tell you the deflection of GD6 in branchial space, those equations are related, they relate the presence of essentially quantum of energy in, in um, branchial space to the deflection of GD6 in branchial space those equations are the Feynman path integral of quantum mechanics. So it's kind of a remarkable thing that um, the Einstein equations in general relativity are the same phenomenon as the path integral in quantum mechanics, just played out not in physical space, but in the quantum mechanics is played out in branchial space. And so question would be, what's the analog of that? What is the analog of quantum mechanics for combinators? How does that work? Um, what is uh, what can we say about uh, the analog of the path integral and so on for combinators? And uh, but uh, because they have the same idea of branchial space. Okay, well, actually, combinators have one thing in addition that isn't in in the physical universe. They have not only do they have time-like separation, they don't really have space-like separation. Their space is pretty pretty trivial. They're, they're just full of black holes um, and, and other weird weird sort of deformations of space. They don't really have this notion of extended space in the way that hypergraphs do. Um, they also have branch-like separation. That's what gives us this branchial space. Oh, I, I should have said, by the way, that the coordinatization of branchial space that I think is deeply related to a bunch of combinator of uh, things that have been done with combinators, the coordinatization of branchial space is the story of how you actually get things like quantum phases and quantum mechanics. And it's, it's, uh, it's very much the story of how, how quantum mechanics in detail works. By the way, one of the things that's also pretty nice about thinking about sort of physics at this, you know, the machine code of physics is one way you can figure out whether you're right about how it works is you can essentially try and compile existing things to this machine code for physics. And we've been pretty successful recently in essentially compiling uh, the standard formalism of quantum computing into, uh, into kind of the machine code of, of these uh, um, models based on hypergraph rewriting, um, also compiling, uh, actually, uh, um, Jonathan Gora just got results just in the last few days showing actual black hole simulations based on our um, uh, 
based on compiling things into this sort of low level machine code of hypergraphs. Um, well, okay, so, so combinators have one twist that goes beyond um, what we see in physics. They have another form of separation that one might call tree-like separation. And so what happens in combinators is in addition, do I have a picture of this? Um, in addition to, uh, oh, those are, that's a, a zoo of multi-way graphs for combinators. Um, the, uh, in addition to the separation that you get by having, um, uh, maybe this is one, no. Um, in addition to separation that you get uh, in time, in space, in branch shield space, you also have tree-like separation where essentially one combinator form can be nested inside another combinator form. That's something which we don't have, uh, I, I think, in the physical universe. There is a theory called scale relativity that um, uh, kind of suggests that uh, it, it sort of posits that kind of thing to exist in, in the physical universe, but I don't, think it, I, I don't think that's really the way it works there. So, okay, that was a little bit of an introduction to combinators and, and uh, why we care about them. Let me just mention a few more things about sort of the combinators in the wild. Um, and then we'll talk about a little bit of the, the his history of, um, uh, of sort of uh, how combinators have fitted into the history of mathematical logic and the history of computation. And then I'm going to talk about Moses Scheinfinkel. So uh, one thing we can do, uh, one, one sort of interesting direction, once we have this idea that we can kind of compile everything into combinators, we've got sort of this very simple basis for computation, we can start asking things like, um, well, uh, can, we, can we understand things about computation just by compiling it into this very simple basis? For example, we could say, you know, a thing people study is computational complexity theory. We, we're, where we're asking, you know, what is the fastest running program that computes a particular kind of thing? Well, when you have a very simple representation of programs, you can actually go ahead and, and start answering, asking that question empirically. And I've done that for Turing machines and other kinds of things before, but let me show you some results for combinators. So these are, uh, these are memory time trade-offs for combinators. So these are basically showing when you're going to compute things, um, are they, uh, this is showing, I think this is time and that's memory. This is showing there are things that you compute and sometimes there will be a, a more time efficient way to do it that uses more memory and the other way around, but this is kind of giving you sort of empirical computational complexity theory. Um, and uh, we can then ask questions like, when you find the simplest program, when you find the smallest program that computes something, how does it do it? Does it have just one idea for doing it? Or does it have many different ideas for, for doing that computation? And so you can ask these questions about that this is a, a particular thing where these are the shortest programs that compute a particular thing. And it's kind of showing the different ideas that these programs use to do that computation. And, and you can do the same kind of thing. Not only can you deal with that with deterministic computations, you can also do that for non-deterministic computations using multi-way graphs. And multi-way graphs are kind of the story of non-determinism. They're kind of the, the, uh, the representation of non-deterministic processes. Um, now, another question you can ask then is, let me see, what do I have here? Um, uh, so, so this kind of empirical um, computational complexity theory, you can also ask questions like, okay, um, if we're going to compute, oh, those are just two examples of computing x of x. I think that's the multi-way graph that shows those computations um, and different paths through it. Um, but, but one thing we can ask is, um, if we're going to compute, a, if, we, if we want to compute a particular thing, what is, for example, the shortest program that computes it? Um, and, and, and for example, when we look at short programs, what can they actually compute? So these are, this is for programs up to a certain size. Uh, this is showing what uh, x expressions can those programs compute. Um, and so we see that there are, these are essentially the x expressions that are easy to compute, that have low algorithmic information content. They come from very small programs, but we can compute them. But remember that, that we might have thought that everything that comes from a small program must somehow be simple. But then we see things like rule 30 or things like the things we've seen with combinators, and we realize that isn't true. In fact, it's probably not even true. Our whole universe is an example of something that probably comes from a simple program and presumably isn't, isn't to, so simple or we shouldn't consider it that way. So, okay, we can ask these questions about um, what, uh, um, oh, questions like, you know, if we're trying to generate different kinds of numbers, what is the, um, 
uh, what is the sort of uh, what, what's what's the algorithmic complexity of generating different kinds of numbers? We can explicitly ask that for combinators. We can ask kind of what their what their sort of uh, um, how they do with computational complexity theory. Now, one one question we might ask is. Uh, when we're thinking about combinators and we're thinking about uh, the fact that they can compute anything, uh, well, we don't tend to use them as practical computers. Could we do that? One of the things that's that um, uh, could we, for example, could we make something, let's say, with molecules that actually implements combinators? Uh, it's um, I don't think it quite works with combinators, but I think things very much like that, it will be possible to do this with them. I mean, one of the things that's come out of my whole effort of my sort of new kind of science of exploring the computational universe is this idea that if you want to get computation, it's easier to get than you might possibly have imagined. And, and I've been on a hunt for many years now for sort of the simplest universal computers of various kinds. So for example, I mentioned that rule 110 cellular automaton that's very simple. Let me show you, um, uh, well, it's another example. Oh, I'm gonna have to type it in. Um, Another example that we found is um, uh, the um, for Turing machines. We know um, this is this is the very simplest Turing machine that is universal. So I've been very interested in this question of what is the threshold of universality in different kinds of systems. For cellular automata, we know that the simplest cellular automata with just two two states per cell and nearest neighbors gives universality for Turing machines. It takes um, uh, uh, um, uh, two states, three colors. That's the simplest possible Turing, universal Turing machine. The question is, it's taken a lot of work to find these simple examples of universality. The remarkable thing is that Moses Scheinfinkel found something that is really close probably to a absolutely minimal version of, of, of universal computation, but it was the first universal computation thing that was ever found. By the way, one question you might ask is, if you just look at just the S combinator, forget, uh, forget there even exists a K combinator. Um, if you just think about the S combinator, what does it do? Does it, can it itself on its own do really complicated things? The answer is yes. And in fact, I think it's even very possible that the S combinator alone is computation universal. One result, and I think we have the originator of that result here. Um, let's see if I have a nice picture of it. Oh, drat, I don't seem to. Um, Let's see, oh, I thought I had a nice picture of this. Uh, one result due to Hannes Waldman from 2000 is that for S combinators, oh, I thought I had this picture. Um, uh, there is a essentially a finite state machine, a tree automaton um, that can basically take one of these combinator expressions and uh, yeah, here, here we go. Uh, that's a very bad version of it. Um, and essentially evaluate, it can tell you from a combinator expression, it can tell you whether that combinator expression, if it involves just S's, is going to terminate or not. It can immediately tell you that by just essentially using this finite state machine to just evaluate the tree, you can work out is this thing going to halt or not. So in a sense, that's like saying for a cellular automaton, um, you can say, well, for rule 30, even though there's much we can't say about it, we can very easily say it's going to go out at maximal speed on each side. This is the same kind of thing. We can say this very fundamental fact about an S combinator expression, we can sort of immediately say, oh, it's not going to halt. The question is, within such expressions that don't halt, what happens? You know, when we first thought about computation, we thought about computation as you give input, grind, 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 you get output. It's kind of a thing where you get to a result where things halt. But in modern times, our computers don't usually, we don't usually want them to just halt. Really, computation is a story of things that continuously happen, and we just have to sort of tap into that and get the results we want. And so the question is, can one do that for the pure S combinator? Can one actually find that, uh, that Schoenfinkel didn't even need a K combinator? An S combinator alone would have been enough to give universal computation. My, my guess is that that will work and that there's sort of a harness that can be put on S combinators that will essentially let you run them to do any computation one wants. Um, that's something that I, I, I will be surprised if that's not the case because in sort of searching the computational universe for different kinds of systems, whenever the behavior of those systems doesn't seem sort of obviously trivial, it's turned out that those systems are capable of universal computation. And uh, either there's some very basic mathematical facts that we could discover that would allow us to sort of unravel the complexity of S combinators, or, um, or they're going to be computation universal. Okay, 
Well, so that was sort of a rather long uh, description of uh, of combinators and why we care about them. I, I just wanted to say that that um, uh, in terms of thinking about sort of what the foundations of computation might be, we've been get definitely going down. We've we've done the 1910 uh, NAND Sheffer route for computation. That's how all our computers get made. Uh, we didn't do the combinator 1920 route. Um, it's not clear whether we could instead do that. It's not clear whether when we start to build computers out of individual molecules, for example, whether in fact that isn't a good route to go. Those are interesting things to explore. I mean, I, I, I might say just sort of in the, in the big picture of kind of how we think about computation, one of the things that sort of my realization about, about the nature of computation is uh, from what we see about very simple computational systems being able to produce such complexity of behavior, one of the things, and that we so easily get universal computation, one of the things we realize is that there's sort of this ocean of computational possibility that exists out there. The question for us as sort of humans wanting to use this is, how do we take the things that we want to do and map those things into this sort of ocean of computational possibility? And in a sense, the, the story of a lot of my life has been to try and design computational language that bridges that, uh, that divide between what we humans like to think about and what's possible out in that sort of ocean of computational possibility. And uh, that's some, um, I mean, what, what I've been trying to do is to kind of build that sort of notation that we can use. It's kind of the analog of the effort that people did 400 years ago to build kind of mathematical notation to kind of define how you talk about things mathematically. My interest has been to define kind of how you talk about things computationally and to do that not just at the level of raw computation, not just at the level of what computers intrinsically do, but at the level of computation that we care about as humans, whether we're interested in geometry or graphs or, or things about movies or things about geography or whatever else, to essentially have a notation for computation that, um, uh, that, that, um, uh, is, that bridges kind of what we humans care about to what is possible in the computational universe. Um, and uh, that provides kind of the, the kind of notation that in the case of mathematics, let one, once mathematical notation was invented, people could invent algebra and calculus and so on. It's kind of the analog today is once we have this kind of computational language, we can then really start to, to build the computational X fields and so on. So one of the things that, um, uh, and so there's, a, there's sort of a, um, well, the, the yeah, and in, 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 um, one thing to mention about um, uh, computational language design, it's, it's all about kind of m matching what humans can understand with what's possible in the computational universe. And one of the problems with combinators is they're pretty hard to understand. One of the features of combinators is you don't ever have to name variables. When you have a combinator, we have some combinator expression, it just tells you the tree is gonna be built this way. The symbolic expression is gonna be built this way. Um, you don't have to say, well, I'm going to call one piece of the tree X, another piece Y, and so on, and so on, and so on. When, if we look at kind of what's happened in the history of combinators, kind of the core ideas of combinators and how they work, essentially all of those ideas have been well integrated into computation as we now practice it. The one that hasn't is this don't name anything. Now, of course, in human language, we're used to naming things. We have nouns, we have pronouns. Um, we are, we are, it, is, it is very important to us as humans that we get to name things. We get to kind of give symbolic names to things in the world, but combinators don't do that. Combinators just have this kind of raw representation that just says you put all these pieces this way and this way and this way and this way, and then the whole thing assembles itself. They don't give names to things. So I've been very curious for a long time, is there a way that we can use that? Is there a way that people will understand that? Will people ever understand that? If we look at the history, of, uh, uh, of kind of intellectual development, there are things that uh, even 30 years ago, for example, I couldn't have put into a computational language because people just didn't understand those things. But gradually there's enough ambient understanding. There are words that get invented for things. People say, oh yes, I know what that means. You can then reason in terms of it. You can then put it into a computational language. There's a question of, is that gonna be possible for combinators? We're at a hundred years now and uh, we still, combinators are not things that humans normally understand. Now, one thing I might say 
is that combinators, in a sense, they've taken this idea of symbolic expressions and they've kind of washed all the meaning out of them. You know, when we write down a symbolic expression, it has a plus and a times and a this and that in it. We say, there's a plus, there's a times. We know what those mean. But with combinators, we're kind of washing all of that out. And it's just a bunch of S's and K's. Um, how do we, is that useful? Is it useful to do that? Is it useful to have these kind of washed symbolic expressions that have nothing, they're just kind of the pure skeleton? Well, I have to say, I never really thought it was particularly. Um, but then I realized that, well, I've spent my life basically building computational languages that are based on symbolic expressions. They're based on symbolic expressions where there are actual names for the elements in those symbolic expressions. Right? Maybe in, in Wolfram language today, there are about 6,000 of these names that represent different kinds of things, whether it's geopositions or whether it's chemicals or, or whatever else. Um, those, those, uh, that, that idea of symbolic expressions with names, that's what's useful. But then I realized as we're building this model for physics, I realized in sort of an embarrassment for me that these symbolic expressions that I'd been using for 40 years, actually the skeleton version of those basically is physics. In other words, if you take symbolic expressions and you get rid of all, you scrub out all of the actual meaning and you just take the structure and actually in the case of in the physics ones we're dealing with, they're just sort of two level symbolic expressions that represent these hypergraphs. The, the life of those kinds of things seems to be physics. Um, and so in other words, it's, it's like with combinators where we kind of uh, you know, scrubbed out all the meaning. What do we have left? Well, we have combinators. The, the, the close analog of that for hypergraphs seems to be physics. So again, it's something where what, what Moses Scheinfinkel talked about 100 years ago uh, was something where he's kind of scrubbing all the meaning out. Um, and what, what do you get? Well, one of the things you seem to get is physics. OK, let me, let me talk a little bit. I, I'm running way over time, and maybe I should skip. I, I, I want to just give some kind of indication of, of uh, kind of the, the historical arc of, uh, of combinators and how they relate to other kinds of things that, um, uh, that sort of happened. Um, I would say that, that the whole effort of Moses Scheinfinkel is part of a long arc of sort of uh, representing things in a formal symbolic way. And I suppose one could trace the, the earliest examples of that to antiquity, uh, to basically logic and geometry. You know, Aristotle was cataloging animals and cataloging all kinds of things. And one of the things he wanted to catalog was arguments and forms of arguments. And that led him to basically come up with logic as a representation, as a disembodied symbolic representation of forms of arguments. And um, so many years went by, many things happened. Um, but then uh, by the time we got to, uh, uh, well, the 1800s, um, there's sort of a question that arose that, that pe people started realizing that there were things, th things like logic had come out of sort of the actual arguments people make. Things like Euclidean geometry had come out at that time of the actual way that space seemed to work. I now think that, that the very first assumption of Euclid um, about the continuity of space is wrong, but um, uh, be that as it may, um, the, uh, the, the, it, it, it did very well to go from our perception of space to these, uh, to these sort of axiomatization of, 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 of geometry. But so then what happened in the 1800s in with, with group theory and and then uh, Lobachevsky's work on, on non Euclidean geometry, and then transfinite numbers, things like that, was this idea that you could make up formal systems where you could say, these are the rules for the system. I don't know whether this corresponds to anything real, so to speak, um, but they're just these formal rules for a system, and I can go and work things out based on these formal rules. So one of the things that was needed when you started talking about formal rules, I mean, today, when we talk about formal rules, we have a framework for talking about those. It's computation. When we say formal rules, that could be translated into essentially programs. But back in those days, there wasn't any such translation. People didn't know that. And so there's a question of how would you represent these formal rules? And that was partly a story of mathematical notation, partly the story of sort of developing a way to represent formal rules. And so, sort of a, a, a big piece of uh, a, a sort of a big piece of progress in that um, there were a variety of different steps. People like Leibniz were involved in it. Other people, uh, Frege, uh, 1879, um, his uh, um, oh I can never say this big big Griffiths Schrift, uh, his kind of concept script, which was kind of a way of, of writing down what we would now call predicate logic, uh, things with quantifiers and so on. Um, he had this. Uh, uh, this rather elaborate graphical notation 
um, which I kind of wonder whether it's actually might be useful in modern times um, now that it's really easy to, to have sort of graphical input for things and so on. I don't know. But in any case, he had kind of a, an effort to sort of represent everything in terms of predicate logic with this kind of, uh, with this kind of script. Um, then, uh, let's see, I think this is Piano probably. Uh, Piano um, developed a kind of a, a, a similar formalization. Um, he just, for good measure, he actually developed his own uh, natural language based on Latin um, that was going to be used to represent the, the textual parts of things as well as the notation for, for, the, uh, uh, for the mathematical part. But kind of the idea was, let's take sort of everything we can talk about in mathematics and find a notational way to represent that. And um, sort of a, a big, uh, at least a big sort of PR stunt of that um, was uh, in, um, in 1910, uh, Whitehead and Russell started publishing their ultimately 2000 page Principia Mathematica book um, where they wanted to show that basically all the things we normally talk about in mathematics could be reduced to and notated in terms of the concepts of logic. And they were very proud of, I think it takes them until page 400 or something to talk about the number two and so on. Um, this stuff is, is very hard to read. I think it's actually a great example of really bad language design. Um, there are just many, many, many things wrong with it um, that uh, uh, sort of a modern language designer can look at it and say, that was just the wrong way to do it. Um, but in any case, it was uh, in its time, it was very influential in giving people the idea that maybe one could build sort of everything in mathematics just from logic. Maybe one could represent everything in mathematics from the, from the constructs of logic, and maybe one could build up all the ideas of mathematics that way. And one person who was very interested in related things was David Hilbert. So in the 1890s, he'd started thinking about, okay, given the Euclidean geometry, Euclid had certain informal axioms for things. Um, is there a way to, um, uh, uh, is there a way to kind of tighten that up? By the way, I, I recently just did a, a big study of sort of the empirical metamathematics of Euclid. That's the axiom network of Euclid. Uh, he has 410, 10 axioms, 465 theorems that are proved, and that's kind of the network of what gets proved from what. In a sense, we can think of, uh, by the way, these multi-way graphs as like metamathematical space. They are the space of all possible, of all possible theorems that can be proved. And that's kind of the, the, the underlying space then what somebody like Euclid gets to do is to say from that underlying metamathematical space, where should we humans populate? Which, which of the, all the possible theorems that we could prove, which ones should we care about? What is the geography as opposed to the geometry of metamathematical space? And that's just an example of kind of a, a simple empirical metamathematics. This is one for, I think that one is for, that one's probably for metamath, that one is for lean. Those are just the proofs of the Pythagorean theorem um, in those systems. But these are kind of representations of, um, uh, of kind of metamathematical space. But so, uh, um, Hilbert was interested in this question of sort of how can you tighten up the axioms of geometry? How can you really make sure that just as a formal mechanical process, you can go from the axioms to just grind out the theorems of that Euclid had, or in fact, in general, all possible theorems of geometry. So, so uh, Hilbert was interested in that. Um, in 1900, he starts giving his, his big list of problems and so on. Then for about 20 years, uh, Hilbert kind of lost interest in those kinds of things. And instead, he got interested in something very uh, close to my interest. He got interested in the foundations of physics. He got interested in wondering whether, in fact, just as one had been able to sort of mechanize and figure out there are these axioms that make mathematics, can we similarly axiomatize physics? And actually, the thing he was most interested in was can we go from an atomistic description of nature to the continuum? And that turns out to be exactly what we need for our current theory of physics. And it's kind of amusing that in Hilbert's you know, 23 problems or something that he gave in 1900, um, some of those problems have fallen to undecidability, like Hilbert's 10th problem and so on. Have, have, it's turned out that he said, prove this, do this. And it's turned out that's just not doable um, the, because of undecidability, because of essentially the, the sort of infinite consequences of, of computational irreducibility. Well, I think it was Hilbert's sixth problem was find an axiomatization of physics. And I think we, are, we can think of our project as in a sense an effort to, to do that. And that 
problem is going to fall the same way to computational irreducibility and undecidability as a bunch of other Hilbert's other problems. So it's just a, a funny footnote to these kinds of things. But anyway, so for many years, Hilbert was mostly interested in, um, uh, in, in, the, in the foundations of physics. Um, then towards the, uh, the end of the 1910s, um, he got interested again in, um, uh, in the foundations of mathematics. Um, and there was a, at that point with Whitehead and Russell and so on, there was a sort of big push to find, you know, can we find the simplest foundations for everything? And so, for example, even when Whitehead and Russell heard about Sheffer's results about um, uh, the the uh, about NAND, um, they said, oh, we can in the second edition they kind of say, oh, we can actually make our logic even simpler by doing this. Um, I might say that when you when you're dealing with NAND logic, one of my little achievements in life was. Uh, uh, finding the very simplest axiom system, it turns out to be a single axiom uh, for Boolean algebra um, in, in, the case of, uh, in the case of NAND. Um, that's the result. And there's a, a um, I found this in, in 2000, there's a, there's a giant proof of it that you can now just, just do in Wolfram language. It takes a few seconds um, and you can kind of see what the network of lemmas is that, that makes it. But this is kind of, the, this is kind of a, a minimalized version of, um, uh, of, of kind of what you would need to, to launch some of the things that were, for example, in Principia Mathematica. Um, but in any case, the, the, um, uh, what, um, um, uh, so, so that was kind of the setup was um, uh, at the time, Hilbert had gotten interested in, in um, uh, kind of uh, gotten reinterested in, um, uh, in these kind of foundations of mathematics and had this kind of idea that you could, if you could represent uh, mathematics in some very simple form, then um, uh, then uh, and, and get all of its axioms, you could then just sort of grind out all the true theorems of mathematics. Not everybody, uh, well, the, it, it's some, um, okay. Well, Moses Scheinfinkel, as we'll talk about, uh, was in Göttingen um, and was deeply influenced by um, by what Hilbert was trying to do, by Hilbert's sort of program of um, can you turn all mathematics into axioms and then just grind out the results of mathematics. Um, and so in a sense, what he did was um, uh, uh, came out of that tradition. He was attempting to sort of uh, uh, do the minimal version of that Hilbert program. What is the very simplest um, kind of foundation uh, which one can build this out of? Uh, let, me, let me just sort of skip ahead here. Um, if, uh, by the way, I might say that I, I posted today three rather large um, uh, 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 essays about combinators. Um, I had started a couple of months ago thinking, oh, I should, uh, should, should uh, write down some sort of uh, centennial thoughts about combinators. They got a bit long. It's probably about 300 pages now there. Um, but so uh, both about sort of combinators in the wild and about the significance of combinators and about the, the history of Moses Scheinfenkel. But um, uh, let me let me just say um, that uh, kind of the 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 um, uh, sort of the what happened with combinators. Let me just mention make a few comments. So I'll talk about in kind of the history of combinators um, after Moses Scheinfinkel um, uh, gave his talk. Basically, nothing happened. Nobody referred to these things. Nobody cared until a chap called Haskell Curry discovered Scheinfinkel's paper. He had been thinking about similar kinds of things. I'll talk about exactly what he thought about and how it related to Schoenfinkel later. Um, but uh, he kind of launched this effort to really understand combinators and understand them as a sort of combinatory logic. Um, and um, some of the people who are here were uh, students or grand students of, of Curry's. Um, and, and that was kind of the, uh, um, the, big, um, the big push for combinators. I think the... Um, um, the thing, uh, you know, a, a large part of what was being done there was an attempt to sort of mathematicize combinators, an attempt to sort of turn them into something more algebraic, more, more uh, controllable by standard mathematics. They're actually very computational creatures. That's actually really hard to do. What was done though, was slicing through various aspects of what combinators do. And what I think is interesting and very significant is some of those slices turn out to be exactly the same slices that we're now finding irrelevant for physics. They're the things that make physics possible basically. And I don't think we're, we're done with mining what one can learn from, from those efforts with, with things like combinators to understand things in physics. And by the way, things in physics inform uh, new ways to think about the kinds of things one's thought about in, in the case of combinators. But let me talk a little bit more about um, uh, 
a couple of things here. So, so first question is this idea of computation. So in, in combinators, we had um, um, uh, combinators were just this thing that in a sense seemed almost notational. Um, is there a way of, um, of representing these expressions of mathematical logic? Is there a way of sort of having mathematical logic work just through something simple like that? Um, well, then the question came up, uh, you know, how does that, uh, how, how general is that idea? So, you know, Hilbert's program of let's just find the axioms and grind out the theorems. The big thing that went wrong with that was Gödel's theorem. Let's see, is this the right page? Yes, there's the right page. And so what Gödel's theorem, which arrived in 1931, um, basically the one way to think about what Gödel did is he showed that it's possible to basically compile anything into arithmetic. So people had, had thought about, in a sense, Schoenfinkel was one direction of what, what, how can you build up everything in mathematical logic? Another direction had to do with recursive functions. You know, Fibonacci had had his in the 1200, had had an example of a recursive function. Even before that, there were examples of the Fibonacci function. But it was known in the 1920s, um, there was a whole bunch of study of recursive functions. People at first thought maybe the primitive recursive functions will be all that was needed to represent all reasonable functions. Then along came the Ackermann function, I think it was 1936, that shows that that's not the case. But the idea that you could sort of represent all reasonable things in terms of recursive functions, that was kind of a notion, one of the possible sort of foundations you could use for mathematics. The thing that Gödel did was to show that lots of mathematics and lots of things that you might have thought of were metamathematics, like statements like this statement is unprovable, that things like that could be compiled into pure arithmetic, that they could be turned into statements about factorials and, and equations with integers and things like this. And that fact was what showed that undecidability was a thing in mathematics and so on. But in a sense, what was done was, it was saying you can take all this stuff in mathematics, you can just compile it down to simple arithmetic. Um, and, and Gödel also used general recursive functions. Uh, that was part of his, his sort of story. Now, for a while, I don't think anybody really understood what the significance of that was um, until basically about 1935, 1936, because that was when uh, uh, both Turing and Church um, did, the, the, did their thing. So what, what Turing did, so, so in fact, Turing, uh, the title of Turing's paper, I don't seem to have it here, um, the, uh, the title of Turing's paper was on computable numbers with an application to the, I'm gonna translate into English because I can't say the German word, to the decision problem. So one of the things that Hilbert had defined as being sort of a key question in mathematics was this idea of a decision problem, this idea of, of could you decide uh, whether some particular theorem was true or false, could you always decide that? And what Turing did was he showed that you could have this construction of this machine that would have an undecidable decision problem, so to speak. And what he did was in particular to show that this Turing machine, the simple construction that he had, not nearly as simple as the Turing machine we have today, uh, that minimal Turing machine that I showed you today, but he had the, the beginning of that road of a quite complicated universal Turing machine, which he showed had the property that with that one machine, you could reproduce the behavior of any other Turing machine. Of course, that's the, that's the thing that's led us to modern computing. It's the thing that told us that software is possible, that with a fixed piece of hardware, just by, choosing to, by changing the software, you can, um, uh, you, can, you can do any computation. So that, that happened in 1936. Meanwhile, in 1935, Alonzo Church had come up with the idea of lambda calculus and um, the, uh, Oh, let me not go into this because I'm going to run out of time horribly. But 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 basically, the idea of lambda calculus, it's what we call function function in Wolfram language. It's um uh it exists, it's now quite quite widely known in um uh uh in computing. Um, but it's it's the idea of having an anonymous function, a function where you basically just say there are these variables and the function can get applied to anything, and then you fill in these variables and get the result. Um, anyway, Church came up with that idea. Now, notice that when he came up with that idea, one of the things that was a big concern was, well, these variables, if we have a function of x and it gets applied to something, what if the thing it's applied to is also a function of x? How do we untangle this collision of variables? How does that all work? And is it even possible to untangle the collision of variables? Or will there be a bunch of paradoxes, maybe like uh, some of the paradoxes of set theory and things like that, that will make it just impossible to untangle the um, 
uh, all those all those uh, sort of conflicted variables. You know, in Wolfram language, if you try and input something that has these conflicted variables, something will turn red. But that's not something you can say that that's not the the kind of level of of uh, of thing that you need in mathematical logic. So when Church wondered, was it possible to untangle things in lambda calculus? What did he do? He had a footnote to Scheinfinkel saying, well, actually, you can get rid of, you can turn these things from lambda calculus into combinators. You can compile lambda calculus into combinators. But then what happened was Church, Church's paper came out just a little bit before Turing's, and uh, uh, Church was sort of trying to take what was kind of the more mathematical formula kind of approach to representing arbitrary things in, in mathematical logic. Turing took this more kind of mechanical approach. It was quickly determined that they were the same thing. It was quickly determined they were the same as recursive functions. Uh, footnote, they were the same as combinators, but people didn't really care about that at that time. But the big thing that happened was all these different definitions of what it might mean to be computable, what it might, how you might construct things, they all turned out to be equivalent. And so that meant that there started to be this kind of robust notion of universal computation that existed. Now, at the time, people weren't sure how robust it was. You know, Gödel thought, oh, maybe, you know, human minds don't, don't work the way that Gödel's uh, sort of construction of things worked. People were very unsure, even up until the 1980s, uh, people, as I, when I started working on sort of applying ideas from computation to things like physics, people said, but of course, physics doesn't work like that. Physics involves real numbers. Physics involves computations that a Turing machine can't do in finite time. Physics is something different. The universe is different. These things that we've constructed in mathematical logic, they are just thought constructions of mathematical logic. They're not sort of things of physics. Well, I think that in the last year, we can now say that's not the case. It really is computation all the way down. And the things that were invented in 1920 by Schoenfinkel and later in the 1930s by other people that represent universal computation, they really are the way that our universe is constructed. They really are all we can get in concrete form in our universe. So in any case, the, the, um, so, so in the 1930s, uh, the development, um, um, that developed this kind of notion of universal computation. Meanwhile, uh, actual computers were getting built. You know, back in the 1830s, you know, people like, uh, well, Charles Babbage had come up with his analytical engine idea, which I think Ada Lovelace understood much better than he did. But um, she kind of understood that you could weave, as she put it, algebraical patterns, as you can weave sort of uh, pictures of, uh, of birds and flowers with the kind of, with a, with a loom. She kind of understood that you could actually do sort of some kind of universal thing that is like computation with a fixed set of instructions, in that case, uh, in, the, in the form that Babbage had specified for the analytical engine. But that idea was largely lost. And what happened in practice was that people built um, first mechanical computers and then later electromechanical computers. And there started to be, people had a unit that would do the addition, a unit that would do this, and they would chain these units together. Things got more and more complicated. By the 1940s, um, there was really the, the uh, people were starting to say, well, we can sort of program these at some level. We can start saying how things are going to work. And there were a variety of kinds of, um, um, uh, of specific ways that was done. Now, a little bit surprising is all this theoretical work, I don't think it had any relevance at all to any of that. That was done by physicists, electrical engineers, things like that. And they were just trying to make stuff work. They didn't really even know about these things done by Gödel and Turing and Scheinfinkel and, and all these kinds of things. But I mean, there was a little bit of kind of more formal stuff that was known. You know, Claude Shannon had shown that Boolean algebra could be used to, to understand switching circuits. That happened in the 1930s. Then uh, things happened like, um, there's a big emphasis in those days on kind of, uh, let's understand sort of, uh, you know, there were complicated electrical machines there were complicated machines in biology, like brains and like animals and so on. Let's try and bring these together. Things like cybernetics were kind of a, an idea to bring these together. And then 1943, McCulloch and Pitts uh, wrote their paper on kind of the a formal description of the nervous system that kind of pulled in ideas like Turing machines and so on to justify the idea that, oh, well, you know, we can have some, a, a nervous system that's just made of all these pieces that are like wires and so on, and it really can do everything. Turing machines sort of proved that, they, they kind of said. Well, kind of a, a link between these things was, was John von Neumann, who both had worked on set theory and things and had worked on mathematical logic, and also was a, an actual consultant 
for the people who were building actual electrical computers. And so he ended up uh, um, writing these reports about sort of how you can be more formal about thinking about computers. And the initial versions of those reports talk about organs and all kinds of other very biological kinds of things. But pretty soon that's turned into talking about um, actual, uh, uh, talking about things like Turing machines and Gödel's theorem and so on. Meanwhile, Alan Turing had gotten involved with computers um, and, and so on. And so there was kind of by, by, I would say the beginning of the 1950s, I think, maybe there are people here who, who were around and can, can correct this, but by the beginning of the 1950s, I think there was a sort of a decent understanding that these, these computers made with electronics had something to do with the kind of idealized universal computers that uh, people like Turing had talked about. And in the 1950s, there was kind of this explosion of interest in what would now be called the theory of computation. But um, most of the work that was done, and there were lots of books, good books written at that time, uh, it was all about uh, you know, finite automata, Turing machines, cellular automata, idealized neural nets, those were, you know, the, a lot of the, um, the sort of the concrete work on models of computation and the early ideas about artificial intelligence, things like that, those tended to concentrate on those more concrete versions of how computation might work, those more engineerable versions. And, and things like lambda calculus, recursive functions, combinators, they pretty much stayed over in the mathematical logic research uh, domain of things. Well, then there started to be early programming languages in the later part of the 1950s. Um, things like uh, Algol and so on, uh, where the, the specification of Al Algol was come up with and, and recursion just snuck in to being something in Algol and so on. And, uh, but a, a lot of what was discussed were things about arrays and APL and things like that were, were a big thing. One exception was what John McCarthy did on Lisp. Um, and that was in 19, 1960, I guess. He wrote a, a kind of a summary of, um, of, of Lisp. Let's see if I have that here. Um, and uh, it's kind of fun. I, I had not looked at this in a long time. I, I, I didn't completely see eye to eye with John McCarthy on everything, but um, uh, I just was looking at this paper about, um, uh, about Lisp from 1960, and I see that there is a version of Lisp that has square brackets in it that looks awfully like modern Wolfram language, um, although his evaluation strategy and other kinds of things is rather different. Um, but in any case, so what McCarthy did in inventing Lisp, he was attempting to kind of make a language for artificial intelligence that would be kind of a, a, a concrete version of recursive function theory. And um, uh, he was, uh, you know, knew about lambda calculus from church and so on. And so he has this lambda thing in, in, in Lisp with all kinds of issues about how the, um, uh, how the variables work and all kinds of issues about using binding as a way to, 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 to set up the variables, a bunch of things which, which nowadays we, we, uh, we have much more of a substitution-based approach. Um, I've used that for the last 40 years in languages I built, which avoids a bunch of those issues. Um, but in any case, he, but I was just looking a couple of days ago at, um, at McCarthy's paper on Lisp. And it's kind of fun because I found this, um, um, this statement, he says, difficulties arise in combining functions described by lambda expressions or by any other notation involving variables because different bound variables may be represented by the same symbol. This is called collision of bound variables. There is a notation involving operators that are called combinators for combining functions without the use of variables. Unfortunately, he says, the combinatory expressions for interesting combinations of functions tend to be lengthy and unreadable. So. That was it, nothing more with combinators. And um, uh, although uh, interesting experiments were done and people even built hardware that uh, was based on, on running combinators, combinators really didn't enter the story of practical computing um, after that time. Uh, nevertheless, uh, th and things like lambda calculus were also not popular in, 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 um, uh, in computing until basically, uh, one started to have kind of the rise of functional programming. And one, one of the things I've noticed about that is that, uh, you know, you can have just a function f of x, and then you can have a thing that is a sort of a g applied to f that's applied to x. You can have this kind of higher order function that applies to the f. What I've noticed is over the years, as we built Wolfram language, people get used to more and more layers of higher orderness, but it takes years. 
Um, and uh, we're just now introducing some kind of higher order things that we've kind of managed to find ways to be able to explain to people that will make use of more sort of layers of that higher orderness. Now in combinators, of course, you kind of go all the way immediately. You've kind of got to all orders and you're kind of thinking about everything in that, that purely symbolic form. All right. Well, you know, combinators have shown up in all kinds of places. Um, uh, you know, one one that's uh, oh, that, that's that's a more serious place. But another was uh, like Raymond Smullyan, who was a, a student of churches, um, who wrote this kind of uh, uh, who had this this whole birds thing going for combinators. Um, uh, uh, Haskell Curry had been a lifelong bird watcher, and so I, I think um, in fact the, to mock a mockingbird is dedicated to to um, uh, to Curry. And then has uh, a bunch of combinators represented as birds. So the S is a starling, the K is a kestrel, and so on. And, and lots of fun things are done with that. Um, the other place where combinators sort of entered popular culture um, is uh, um, a funny place that um, um, is um, in uh, uh, my friend Paul Graham in 2005 was coming up with a, a uh, his startup accelerator. And he thought he was an enthusiast of Lisp. He'd written a big system in Lisp. Um, and he thought, you know, let's pick the Y combinator. Nobody understands the so-called paradoxical Y combinator. Let's pick that. And he named his startup accelerator Y combinator. I think it's kind of fun. I, I, was, I worked out, this is the actual Y combinator, which is, has the feature that if you just run the Y combinator, it generates bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger expressions. And I think it takes, it's, it's kind of a, it reaches unicorn size. It reaches a billion um, after, let me see how many steps here. Um, it reaches a billion after, um, I just worked out after, after um, 494 steps, but it's had lots of kind of ups and downs as startups tend to do. And then after 1248, 1284 steps, it actually is the first time when the size of the combinator expression is, is bigger than the number of dollars of, of, uh, that exist in the world. So that's, a, that's an aspiration for the Y Combinator companies um, based on the original Y Combinator. All right, so, um, you know, combinators show up all over the place. I, I one one place that um, uh, I ended up um, um, running into them. I was given a book by a, a former high school teacher of mine, actually, um, who was a was a copy of a book that had been owned by Alan Turing. And in that book, I'm I'm flipping through this book. In that book, out should flip flip this page, and it's like that's really weird. What on earth is that? This is a, it was actually a book about quantum mechanics. It was Dirac's book on quantum mechanics. Um, this is a bunch of combinators. And so I started this big hunt for who had written this page about combinators. At least I could recognize that this was combinators. Um, that Y isn't the, isn't the Y combinator, it's, it's something else. Um, eventually it turned out this page was written by Robin Gandhi, um, uh, who was a, a, a student of, of, of Turing's. Um, so, okay, all right. Well, I've, I've yacked on for much longer than I had intended. I apologize for that about um, kind of the background to combinators. Let's talk about Moses Scheinfinkel. So um, what do we know about him? As I say, here's a picture of him. And um, uh, first question is, um, and so, so let's, let's sort of begin at the beginning and I'll try and tell you the story of what we know. It's not absolutely complete. It's very frustrating because for me, an idea like combinators, sort of a big idea. And I've been involved a lot in tracing sort of the histories of ideas. And what I've noticed is it usually takes people a decade to come up with a big idea. Even if at the end, it's a very sudden thing, there's usually a very long uh, uh, sort of conceptual development that comes before that. And the question is, what was that conceptual development for combinators? Where did they come from? Did Moses Scheinfinkel just come up with combinators a few weeks before that talk and just say, here they are? Because if you look at his paper, it could be that, that that was the case. The paper is clear enough and simple enough that in principle, it could have just been, oh, here they are. I don't think that was the case, but let's try to understand what we know about Moses Scheinfinkel. So uh, first question is, um, uh, where was he born? He was born in, um, well, actually, okay. I, I have to say there's a uh, kind of a, a thing I noticed, which is there's a, there's a famous Tom Lehrer song from 1953 about plagiarism in mathematics, uh, no doubt a common thing. Um, it's, uh, and it, it has a, a piece that goes, you know, I have a friend in Minsk who has a friend in Pinsk 
who has a friend in Omsk, dot, 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 a series of cities whose friend somehow is solving now the problem that the protagonist of this, of this um, song is, is, is interested in, is solving now the problem in uh, Dnepropetrovsk, 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 okay? Well, Dnepropetrovsk is where Moses Schoenfinkel was born, um, except, and that's sort of ironic, given a bunch of things that happened in, in Schoenfinkel's life. But anyway, um, except somewhat confusingly, at the time, it wasn't called Dnepropetrovsk. It was called Ekaterinas, Ekaterinaslav, uh, named after Catherine the Great. Um, and it was, uh, it was uh, it's in the Ukraine. It's in roughly the center of the Ukraine. Um, it's actually about the fourth largest city in Ukraine. Um, and uh, at the time, uh, Ukraine, at the time when Schoenfinkel was born, um, it was, uh, uh, Ukraine was part of the Russian Empire. So the question is, could we find out about um, Schoenfinkel from that? So it wasn't too easy to track this down, but the first thing we got was this certificate. Yes, it's written in uh, cursive Cyrillic, of uh, old-fashioned cursive Cyrillic, but fortunately somebody at our company knows how to read that. Um, and uh, so we were able to determine from this, this is a certificate that says that um, uh, it's a certificate from the Ekaterinoslav public rabbi stating that entry 272 of the birth register for Jews from 1888 records that on September 7th, 1888, a son Moses was born to the Ekaterinoslav citizen Ilya Scheinfinkel and his wife Masha. Okay, so that might seem pretty straightforward. It's like, okay, great, we got his date of birth. It's September 7th, 1888, but we would be wrong. Even at that level, we're wrong. Even at the level of figuring out when was he born, it turns out to be more complicated. Well, the first subtlety is back in those days, Russia was uh, into the uh, uh, Greek Orthodox, um, uh, uh, well, Russian Orthodox church um, and the Russian Orthodox Church didn't believe in that Pope Gregory uh, idea of reforming the calendar from 1582. So they were still using the Julian calendar introduced by Julius Caesar. So their dates were off from the dates that we use today. So, okay, fine. Um, you can correct that. That means uh, Moses Scheinfinkel was born on September 19th, 1888. Okay, end of story. So one might think. Okay, but then for various reasons, we went back to look at the actual birth register, not the, um, the, the kind of the registration document, but the actual birth register. And it turns out we can find that. Oops. And here we are. This is the actual birth register. This is the uh, birth of um, Scheinfinkel. Uh, this is in Cyrillic, obviously. That's Moses Scheinfinkel. And um, it records that he was born. That's the month. Um, uh, the month is up there. And the day is the 17th. And this is uh, in the Jewish calendar, it's the 24th of that month. And so we can kind of cross check this is really right. So, okay, first bug is the certificate. And in fact, the, that same date of birth of September 7th occurs all over the place in all of the sort of college documents of Moses Scheinfinkel. It's wrong. The actual date of birth, according to the original register, is the 17th of September, which when you correct it to, um, uh, to the modern uh, calendar is the se September 29th, 1888. Okay, great. So we know when he was born. Um, uh, his name is obviously was originally written in Cyrillic. Um, it's been transcribed in a bunch of different ways. That was a joy in terms of tracking down documents. I might say, by the way, that I, I, I would like to thank, it's been quite, a, quite an adventure tracking down all these things about Moses Scheinfinkel. And we've had a bunch of help from a bunch of people kind of on the ground in uh, Germany, Ukraine, Russia, Turkey, um, helping us with this. And a bunch of archives and archivists have been very helpful in, in providing material for that. And thank you for that. Um, in any case, so what do we know about um, Scheinfinkel's background? Well, the, um, the first thing it says on that first document is it says um, Scheinfinkel's father, Ilya Scheinfinkel, um, was a word that if you look it up in a dictionary, it's translated as bourgeoisie. Okay, that's pretty weird. What does that actually mean? It basically means a, a middle-class city dweller. And it turns out it, it says in that document that Ilya Scheinfinkel is a merchant of the second guild. What did that mean? Well, the first guild was the kind of top five percenters. Then there was a second guild, then there was a third guild. So he was in the, in the middle, at least at that time. 
but actually his fortunes improved. But so by 1905, we find in the register of companies of the Russian Empire, we find a company called Lurian Scheinfinkel. Uh, there it is, Lurian Scheinfinkel, um, with a paid in capital of 10,000 rubles. It's only about $150,000 today. Um, that it says here was engaged in the grocery trade. Okay, so it turns out that um, uh, Moses Scheinfinkel's dad owned a chain of grocery stores along with a man called Aaron Lurie. Um, actually, Moses Scheinfinkel's mother, Masha Scheinfinkel, uh, her original name was Masha Lurie. She was the sister of Aaron Lurie. So, so Moses Scheinfinkel's dad, Ilya, was in business with um, uh, his, um, um, his brother-in-law, and they owned a chain of grocery stores. The Lurie family was actually a, a quite uh, uh, a quite distinguished family in Ekaterina's love. They had um, uh, furniture stores and all kinds of other things. Well, now you can go and ask, where were those grocery stores? And uh, we know where a couple of them were. We know this is actually the modern location of store number two. Um, but we also actually have the a contemporary picture of, um, uh, of the location of store number one. And if you look at that word there, if you translate from Cyrillic, that is the end of the word Scheinfinkel. Um, and so that, that originally will have said Lurian Scheinfinkel. Um, I don't know what that word is up there. Maybe somebody can identify that. This was a grocery store. That was uh, Moses Scheinfinkel's dad's grocery store, an actual picture of it. Um, that building no longer exists. That building was uh, destroyed in World War II. Actually, a quite, a quite fine uh, reproduction of that building has now been put in its place. But so to give you a sort of sense, this is kind of the where Scheinfinkel came from. This is kind of a picture of Ekaterina's love from that time. Actually, that was a, the Lurie family uh, later had a candy factory in this building. Um, but uh, you know, at that time, Ekaterina's love, the, the, the fourth largest um, city in, in, in Ukraine was a quite bustling metropolis. It was quite a, an upscale place. And um, uh, by, by 1905 or so, um, uh, Ilya Scheinfinkel was a, a merchant of the first guild, um, you know, a top five percenter, um, was a fairly, a, a fairly well-off family. Okay, so what then happened? Well, the next thing we have from, um, from Moses Scheinfinkel is his high school transcript. Um, so this is, uh, this, is his, um, uh, this is his diploma from high school. Uh, it's really amazing that one can get all this stuff still. Um, but uh, this was a um, this came from the uh, uh, archives in Odessa. Um, this um, um, so it shows he did pretty well in high school. He got five out of five in all subjects. The subjects he studied in high school were theology, Russian. Then important one here you can see it on this thing: logic, uh, Latin, Greek, uh, mathematics. He studied, I think, geodesy, surveying probably, uh, physics history, geography, French, German, and drawing. So he got five out of five in all of those subjects. Good student. Actually, the, the, this diploma goes on to say that in view of his excellent behavior and diligence and excellent success in the sciences, especially in mathematics, the pedagogical council decided to award him the gold medal. So, so he did well in high school. Okay, so then he went to college and um, this is uh, a letter that, so we actually have uh, his complete student file. This exists in the, um, in the archives of, um, uh, uh, in Odessa. Um, that's uh, the, the, the file for, that's Scheinfinkel, um, uh, Moses, um, Ilya, uh, Scheinfinkel, Ilya. Um, that's, this is his student file. Okay, what's in his student file? Well, the first thing we find is a, is a letter here, and that's a signature in Cyrillic, uh, Moses Scheinfinkel. This is a letter in which he explains that um, um, he had wanted to go to the University of Kiev, he says, for purely family reasons, but he was told that the bureaucracy was such that because he came from Ekaterina's love, he was being assigned to a university in Odessa, uh, university, the um, Novosi Rus. Rossiysk University in Odessa. Um, 
And uh, so now he's saying, well, even though he was late and so on and so on and so on, and it reads very much like kind of a modern college, uh, I don't know, and it's a little bit whiny actually. And it sort of says, well, he's been sick. And, and so that's why he wasn't able to get this in on time, but he still really wants to go to college and he wants to go to college in Odessa. Um, so there's some, uh, so that's a, that's a letter from Moses Scheinfinkel and, and indeed they, they let him into college in Odessa and he went there. And um, this is, uh, these are now um, uh, pictures of Moses Scheinfinkel from years that he was in college. Um, the uniform he's wearing is the uniform of the uh, Russian Imperial Army. Um, and uh, they don't really identify. This means he was in, I think, the, um, the third regiment of whatever unit he was in, but it doesn't tell you which, which, uh, which unit he was in. I have some reason to believe he was in, later on he was assigned to the Corps of Engineers. But um, anyway, these are pictures of Moses Scheinfinkel, aged about 19 or 20, um, in, uh, uh, during his time in college in Odessa. So what did he study in college? Well, uh, let's see what we've got here. We have, what is this? Ah, oh, that's his 1906, his kind of, um, his, uh, his sort of certif uh, his, his book of what he was gonna study. And it shows these are the courses he was taking. And this is, um, those, are, those are the courses and that's how much they cost in rubles. College was a really good deal in those days for, for just $300, you could get um, all of these courses. What did Moses Scheinfinkel study? This is his first year in college, fall of 1906. Um, what he studied was for six hours, he studied introduction to analysis. Uh, he also had for two hours, something you wouldn't find quite today, introduction to determinant theory. Um, then uh, uh, for two hours, analytical geometry, five hours of chemistry, three hours of physics, two hours of elementary number theory, and that was his 20 hours that cost about $300. And this is, um, this is the bill showing that, yes, he had uh, successfully paid his, his, uh, his 20 rubles to get those courses. Okay, so we can look at, uh, we have all of his, um, a list of all the college courses he took. It's kind of interesting to see the subsequent uh, courses that he had differential calculus, he had integrals, parts one and two, higher algebra, as well as there was a course called Calculus of Probabilities, which is presumably probability theory. It's kind of interesting to see what people were teaching in 1906. Um, the, uh, uh, there's also determinant theory, which I suppose these days will be called linear algebra. I think that's what this sort of translation of determinant theory would be these days. Um, he also had some other kind of courses, not quite so core. He had one in astronomy, also one in spherical astronomy, also one that was called physical geography, although I suspect that was geodesy. Um, and then by 1908, he was also taking courses like functions of a complex variable. Uh, there's a course called integral differential equations. I would say the integral part of that lost out in the past 100 years. Now there would only be a differential equations course. The integral equations aren't as popular. He also took a course on calculus of variations and a course on infinite series. Um, he also took the only course he took that wasn't about mathematics or, or something very close to that was one course in 1908 on German. And that will be significant. Um, we also have from, the, from, oops, from his kind of lecture book, uh, we also have the names of the professors um, that uh, taught Scheinfinkel. And um, uh, one of them, uh, perhaps the... Um, uh, the, what taught him, the one person who taught him introduction to analysis and also theory of algebraic equations was a person called Shatanovsky. Um, and uh, uh, Samuel Shatanovsky uh, basically appears to have been Scheinfinkel's undergraduate advisor. And so uh, Shatanovsky was himself kind of an interesting character. He had come from, pe people sometimes say in biographies of Scheinfinkel that he came from a, a village in Ukraine, which is simply not true. He came from a, a bustling metropolis in, in Ukraine. But uh, uh, Shatanovsky did come from a village in Ukraine and he had a hard time kind of having the funds to go to university. And he sort of hung around um, uh, where Chebyshev was in, in St. Petersburg and other things. Um, and eventually after, uh, in his forties, um, eventually after being sort of an itinerant tutor in various places, um, eventually um, he came to the university in Odessa and became a lecturer there. And in fact, the, the, uh, in his first year there in, in uh, 1906, he was teaching Scheinfinkel. Now, Shatanovsky, who ended up staying in Odessa until he died in 1929, um, he was apparently a very energetic, but very precise lecturer, was quite axiomatically oriented. In fact, he'd been, he'd been involved in sort of creating axiom systems of geometry, algebraic fields. His particular shtick was order relations. 
Um, and uh, was also, he was a fundamentally a constructivist and he was, um, didn't like the law of excluded middle um, and so on. And actually the lectures from his introduction to analysis course, which is the one that Schoenfinkel took in 1906, were published by a publishing company that he and another professor, that uh, Shatanovsky and another professor started in Odessa. Um, so there, there are some other um, professors here. I'm so bad with these names. There's another one, Jan uh, Schles. I haven't read out these names. I've only been writing these names and I'm gonna really butcher this one. There's a Polish name, uh, Schlesinski, um, who'd been a person who worked with wire stress on things like continued fractions. Um, but an anyway, ended up being one of the people who was a professor of Scheinfinkel's when, uh, as a young man, but um, by the time he was um, in his fifties, he was sort of transitioning to working on logic and he moved to Poland um, where he was one of the people who's, who kind of uh, sowed the seeds for the Polish school of mathematical logic. And he wrote books on things like on the significance of logic for mathematics and so on, which I don't think mentioned Schoenfenkel, but I have not been able to get that book. So I don't know for sure. Okay, so we have a few other documents. We have all kinds of other things from Scheinfinkel's time at, 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 at university. Eventually uh, here he is uh, requesting to graduate in 1910. Um, that's kind of his, his graduation request. And so in 1910, uh, Moses Scheinfinkel graduates from college, uh, having done all of these courses in mathematics. Okay, what happens next? We don't have any documentary evidence, but I'm pretty sure Scheinfinkel went to do compulsory military service in the Russian army. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure that he spent four years there and that pretty much identifies him as having been in the Corps of Engineers because there were different periods of time for different branches of the, of the, um, of the military. Um, and that was, um, that was uh, probably the one that he did. Um, we know that um, he, uh, he then went to Göttingen to study mathematics. He arrived in Göttingen on June 1st, 1914. That's a fairly significant time because as people may know, um, that was sort of a, a, a piece of good luck for Scheinfinkel because we didn't have so much good luck in his life, but that was a piece of good luck um, because um, uh, the, um, um, uh, the um, June, 9, uh, June 28th, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, I think that's right, was the day that Archduke Ferdinand was, was shot and the thing that, that launched World War I. And by uh, June 30th, the, um, uh, the um, I have my month right. Yeah, I think only uh, uh, by by that time, only a few weeks after Scheinfinkel arrived in in Göttingen, was when um, the Russian army mobilized, and Scheinfinkel would have put it, been put into active service in the Russian army, um, but he was not. Um, he he ended up uh, being in Göttingen um, as kind of a a resident alien in Göttingen. Um, so what did you do in Göttingen? Well. Uh, the big person he wanted to work with in Göttingen was David Hilbert. Um, uh, Göttingen was a university town where, you know, it's the one place in the world, probably in the one time in history, when the math professors were famous enough that there were picture postcards of them that were sold at, at local stores. This is the one for Hilbert. Um, we, we really don't know much about what Scheinfinkel did for pretty much the 10 year period um, up until from, well, the, no, I'm sorry, from the period from 1914 to 1920. The next thing we know from Scheinfinkel is this, in uh, the summer semester of 1920, Scheinfinkel along with Paul Bernays uh, took the notes for a course in problems and mathematical logic taught by Hilbert. It's not a particularly profound course. It's really going over pretty elementary things, I think probably even at the time uh, related to, um, uh, uh, to to um, uh, to what was going on there, but but in the summer of 1920, the next sort of documentary thing that we know is that Scheinfinkel took the notes for this course. Okay, the next thing we know is that um, uh, the next event is recorded in the annual um, uh, um, annual report of the German Association of Mathematicians. It is that the German uh, uh, math the, the, the Göttingen Mathematical Society, which wasn't part of the university, the independent society, Hilbert had been much involved with it. There was a talk, Moses Scheinfinkel, Elements of Logic on, oh, this is incorrectly uh, highlighted here. We should fix that. The December 7th there uh, um, was the, um, uh, um, 
was when was when that happened. That was 100 years ago today. Actually, it's fun to see who else was giving talks here. Um, there's quite a lineup. Uh, we've got um, a student of Landau's giving a talk in trigonometric series. We've got a student of Carteolari's giving a talk on discontinuous solutions of variational problems. Then we've got Carl Runger of Runger Cutter fame, who was also a Göttingen professor. He gave a talk on American work on star clusters in the Milky Way. And then a chap who was an assistant of Van der Waals gave a talk on explanation of natural laws using a statistical mechanics basis. And then the next week was Moses Scheinfinkel, 100 years ago. Week after Moses Scheinfinkel, Paul Bernays, um, who worked with Hilbert and in fact interacted with Scheinfinkel, as we'll talk about, uh, was speaking about a quite different topic. He was speaking about uh, probability, the arrow of time, and causality. Now, the fact that combinators and the basic ideas of combinators are deeply related to the arrow of time and causality, that had to wait 100 years to get figured out. But those two successive talks are kind of fun to see. Um, next, we have um, uh, Joseph Petzolt talking about the epistemological basis of special and general relativity. Then January 25th, I mean, Nerva um, talks about elementary divisors and general ideal theory. Then Richard Courant, these are all famous names, and Paul Bernays together talk about, about the new arithmetic theories of Weil and Brouwer. And then finally, on February 22nd, David Hilbert makes a, a cameo appearance on a new basis for the meaning of a number. So, that, so yes, he was back working on, 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 um, uh, on, on foundations of mathematics. And as, I, as the, the background behind me is the, is the building that um, we know that talk happened in. This was the auditorium building of the University of Göttingen, which was the place that also housed the Mathematics Institute. Okay, what's the next thing we know about Chan Frinkel? Well, we have um, one piece of information about him, which is that um, on January 23rd, 1922, Hilbert turns 60. And there was a picture taken at that event. And there's David Hilbert, and there's Moses Scheinfinkel. There's a picture that's often shown of Moses Scheinfinkel. It makes him look a little bit nutty because he's kind of got, uh, I guess a flash just went off and he's like, oh, wow, a flash went off. Um, the, um, uh, but um, this picture has many famous um, uh, people in it, um, particularly uh, 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 Hilbert at that time surrounded himself with physicists like Peter Debye, uh, Theodore von, von Kármán, Ludwig Prantl, people like that. Um, these were um, uh, uh, because because Hilbert had been very interested in physics. That that's that's how that worked. Now, one thing that was, was very convenient for us today in the Hilbert archive is a gift that Hilbert was given on his birthday. Um, that is, uh, it was a book. It was a book of pictures of mathematicians. Um, and uh, it's 44 pages of pictures of mathematicians. Well, on page 22 is this page, and there's the picture of Schoenfrenkel, um, along with uh, various other people here. Um, uh, there was a person, this person here was a, had been a student of Arnold Sommerfeld's and was a kind of physics assistant to Hilbert, uh, various other people here doing various things. Um, uh, Bayman was a um, uh, student of Hilbert who worked on mathematical logic um, a little bit more to say about him in, in a moment. Okay, so we, we've located, we know where Scheinfinkel was at least one particular day in, uh, um, in, uh, in, in um, 1922. Okay, well, what was happening for Scheinfinkel? Not all was good. This is a letter that was written by Moses Scheinfinkel's younger brother, Nathan Scheinfinkel. This letter was written, it's not dated, but from other things we know it was written in 1921 or 1922. And it's, it's probably the most extended uh, information that we have about kind of the personality of Moses Scheinfinkel. I can read you an English version of it. So it says, I received a, a letter from the rabbi, Dr. Behrens, in which he wrote that my brother was in need, that he was completely malnourished. It was very difficult for me to read these lines, even more so because I cannot help my brother. Now, remember, this is 19, 1921, 1922. So World War I has come and gone. World War I, uh, Göttingen and its mathematics department kept operating through World War I. Um, it was uh, the, the, the nearest actual action in World War I was about 200 miles away in Belgium. Um, and uh, the things just kept on going. And, um, and, and Scheinfinkel was there. He was, will have been, a, as we'll talk about in a minute, he will have been a, a resident alien there from actually a, 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 an enemy power from Russia. But um, he kept on being there in, in Göttingen. But in any case, so, so his brother Nathan writes, um, uh, he cannot help my brother. I haven't received any messages or money myself for two years. 
So that kind of tells us that uh, the, the Scheinfinkel brothers were kind of being supported uh, by their parents in Ekaterina's love uh, from, uh, from uh, at, at that time. So it says, um, thanks to the good people where I live, so Nathan Scheinfinkel lived in Bern in Switzerland. Um, he was a graduate student in the physiology department there. Um, good, thanks to the good people where I live, I am protected from severe hardship. I am able to continue my studies. I hope to finish my PhD in six months. A few weeks ago, I received a letter from my cousin stating that our parents and relatives are healthy. My cousin is in, is in somewhere in, in Romania. Uh, received a letter from her parents in Ekaterina's love. Parents want to help but cannot do so because the postal connections are non-existent. Um, I hope these difficulties will not last long. My brother is helpless and impractical in this material world. Uh, so is the life of somebody who works on combinators. He is a victim of his great love for science. Even as a 12 year old boy, he loved mathematics and all window frames and doors were painted with, ma with mathematical formulas by him. As a high school student, he devoted all his free time to mathematics. When he was studying at the University of Ode in Odessa, he was not satisfied with the knowledge there and his striving and ideal was Göttingen and the king of mathematics, Professor Hilbert. So remember, he's writing this letter to David Hilbert. When he was accepted in Göttingen, he wrote, he once wrote to me the following, my dear brother, it seems as if I am dreaming, but this is reality. I'm in Göttingen. I saw Professor Hilbert. I spoke to Professor Hilbert. Well, the war came and with it suffering, my brother who is helpless has suffered more than anyone else, but he did not write to me so as not to worry me. He has a good heart. I ask you, dear professor, for a few months until the connections with our city are established to help him by finding a suitable, not harmful to his health job for him. I will be very grateful to you, dear professor, if you will answer me. Sincerely, Nathan Scheinfinkel. There's no known answer to that letter. But we do know that after that letter was written, Scheinfinkel was at least in good enough graces with David Hilbert to be at his birthday party. Well, what's the next thing we know about, um, about Moses Scheinfinkel? The next thing we know is another item in the University Archive in Göttingen, which is this document. This document says in English, the Russian Privat Docent of Mathematics, Mr. Scheinfinkel, um, is hereby certified to, has worked in that, to have worked in mathematics for 10 years with Professor Hilbert in Göttingen. Okay, and it's signed by the university secretary. And it's being sent over here to a Frau Reza Neuberger in Bern. Okay, and um, so first thing is who's it sent to? Well, Reza Neuberger later became Reza Scheinfinkel. She was the wife of Nathan Scheinfinkel. And the address that's given there is actually still the address of the physiology department of the University of Bern. So this, this for some reason, this is a carbon copy. This document was apparently sent on the 18th of March, 1924 to uh, the uh, either then or future wife of, of uh, Moses Scheinfinkel's brother. Okay, there's an important other clue here. This says ad acta means for the record. Um, and it says here, I'm not gonna try and do this in German because I'm useless at that, but it says basically, um, uh, well, it says Gott sei Dank das SCH Veg East, which basically uh, translates into English, thank goodness SCH, Schoenfinkel presumably, is gone. So the university secretary is writing this very pro forma uh, uh, kind of recommendation for Scheinfinkel, and so, but but writes for the record. Uh, thank goodness he's gone. It's kind of like in a modern HR record, it might be the not eligible for rehire tag has been set. So so something something funny happened there. Okay, but let's let's look a little bit more at this document. It says the Russian Privet de Santa Mathematics, Mr. Scheinfinkel, has been working with Hilbert, etc., etc., etc. Okay, there's a little bit something a little bit funny here. If he was a Privet de Sant, there should be documents about that. Because a private descent, kind of the system then, as I, I gather also now, is you know you get a PhD, two years, five years, whatever, get a PhD. Then after that, you uh, do a habilitation and you get this certificate to teach, this official uh, uh, teaching certificate, which allows you to become a private descent and allows you to teach to lecture at the university. And it's a big deal to get that. And we have the documents where other people like, uh, like um, 
um, uh, like Benais and like Bayman, we have the documents where they got their privatisant uh, certificates. It's a sort of a state university sanctioned thing. It's sanctioned by the university senate. It's a state government thing. You now got a license to teach. There is no such information about Scheinfinkel. In fact, all the information about every paper that's published, every talk that's given, all of the kind of uh, becoming privat descents and, and PhDs and all that, all that information was recorded in the annual uh, in the annual book of the Association of German Mathematicians. There is nothing about Scheinfinkel in there. Um, the only thing that appears is his talk in 1920. Um, then subsequently, another talk he gives with Bernays, and another report on a talk uh, by by uh, report of a, of a talk somewhere else given by Bayman, uh, as reported by by uh, by by Courant. But we've gone through all of these books, nothing. So so what this university secretary said here is simply not true. He wasn't a private descent of mathematics. Why did this university secretary write this? We don't know. He was clearly happy to see him go. Well. What else do we know? Um, so we're going to talk about who this university secretary was and what might have happened there. But the first question we can ask is, um, you know, where? Well, no, let, let's talk about that now. Okay, so that university secretary uh, was a person called Ludwig Gossmann, and uh, we didn't think anything much about Ludwig Gossmann until we asked the the archivists in Göttingen about him, and they said, well, actually, now that we look at it, we have 500 pages on him, the result of a criminal investigation. So, okay, something, something funny is going on here. So here's the story of Ludwig Gossmann. He was about, um, uh, so let's see. Um, he was about 10 years older than, than Scheinfinkel. Grew up in Göttingen, father was a janitor at the university. Uh, he finished high school, didn't go to college, ended up working for the state government. Then at age 28 in 1906, he was hired by the university as its secretary. And that's actually a fairly significant position. It was a, it was a person who reported directly to the vice rector of the university, um, who's sort of a third in command at the university, responsible for general administrative matters, um, but also uh, notably the, the supervision of foreign students um, at the university of whom there were many, including uh, Scheinfinkel. So anyway, Ludwig Gossmann was in the position of university secretary for 27 years. Um, and even as each year the university had a different rector, he stayed as university secretary for 27 years. Now, it turns out Ludwig Gossmann also had a sideline. He was a real estate developer. Um, and he, he built, uh, he borrowed a bunch of money, including from a bunch of professors. He built a bunch of houses in Göttingen and he rented those houses uh, to, um, in particular, to international visitors and international students at the university. So, so he was in the, he was a, um, uh, 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 in, in real estate. Okay, so many years went by. Then on January 24th, 1933, is this newspaper headline. Um, it's in Fraktur, Gothic, German, a little hard to read. Okay, so the translation into English is sensational arrest. Senior university official Gossman arrested on suspicion of treason. Communist posters confiscated from his apartment. So, okay, that started a whole chain of investigation. Um, and it, it was said that perhaps this was a setup. It, there's some evidence that Gossman was gay and that this was, uh, uh, although he, he actually did get married at age 54, a year earlier than this, uh, to a woman named Elfried. Um, but uh, in any case, it was, it, was, it was said it might have been a setup. But in any case, this was the, um, this was the thing. But as a result of this, um, this allegation, uh, lots of investigation was done of Gossman and there's 500 pages of documents about him. Unfortunately, he was, um, uh, um, uh, it was sort of not a good time to be accused of being a communist in, in Germany. Um, you know, Hitler was about to come to power, partly propelled by, by sort of fear of communism. And uh, Gossman was taken to Hanover for questioning. Um, ha Gossman had had bad health for a number of years. We, we know that. Uh, he was actually allowed to go back home under sort of house arrest, but he ended up dying of a heart attack on, on February 24th, 1933. So shortly after this. But anyway, that's the story of um, the, the S, the person who wrote this, um, thank goodness Schoenfinkel is gone. We don't know exactly why he wrote that, but that's, um, that's what we know about it. Now, what else do we know about Schoenfinkel? Uh, people's, uh, the, the was, where did Schoenfinkel live when he was in Göttingen? 
Well, it turns out because he was a, an alien and no less an enemy alien living in Göttingen, he was required to register with the police in Göttingen, every address that he was at. And it turns out that um, I suppose uh, German organization being what it is, um, those records still exist. We got them from the Göttingen city archive. And um, let's see, this is, this is Scheinfinkel's uh, complete list of all the addresses he lived at during the years he was in Göttingen. So this shows that he arrived on June 1st. Now, just to add some confusion to the whole thing, this is yet another date of birth, completely wrong for, for Moses Scheinfinkel. And maybe that was fudged for some reason to do with military service or something like that, I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, maybe somebody just misread it from a passport, misconverted it from, from Julian calendar, I don't know. But anyway, that's the complete list of addresses that Scheinfinkel lived at. And actually we can, uh, we, can we got a map of, of, um, of Göttingen, uh, from 1920, and that's the that's where Scheinfinkel lived, and and that's the Math Institute, and so you see he's sort of dotting around, nothing very exciting. Uh, it's kind of a, a blow up. Um, he moved 11 times in the 10 years that he was in Göttingen, um, but then what this records is that on March 18th, 1924, he left to go to Moscow. Okay, so we know where he was all the time in Göttingen. We don't know who he interacted with, but we know where he was. Now. Um, his paper uh, came out in 1924, and it has a footnote that says that um, this paper was uh, prepared. It's, it's sort of formal. Uh, it's it's um, uh, it's it's uh, it was stylistically prepared for publication. Let's see, the formal and stylistic processing for this publication was done by H. Bayman in Göttingen, um, but it lists. Uh, importantly, it lists Scheinfinkel as being in Moscow at that time. That was in 1924. So this is his paper. Uh, this is Heinrich Bayman. Talk a little bit about him in a minute. This is the journal that the paper was published in, the Mathematische Annalen, with a distinguished masthead with Felix Klein, David Hilbert, Albert Einstein, a good crowd, um, plus a bunch of physicists there. Um, one thing is interesting about this. Uh, with respect to, uh, and we also see the, the list of editors, including their home addresses and so on. Um, if we look at uh, who was also published in that same issue, uh, th this is the same volume of, of the Mathematische Annalen. Uh, we see a bunch of different names here. We see a bunch of people, but one significant one, the, the actual publication was in August of that year. The actual issue of the Mathematische Annalen that contained Scheinfinkel's paper was in August of that year. Why is that significant? Well, uh, it's significant because remember the paper said in Moscow. The question is that there's actually an admonition in the, is it here? I do I have it somewhere here? There's an admonition in the inside cover of the Mathematische Annalen saying, don't make changes in proofs. Please authors, don't make changes in proofs. It costs the journal 6% of all of its revenues to deal with changes in proofs. Don't make changes in proofs. But anyway, the journal tried to stay up to date and one of the people who is um, uh, uh, published in here is Urasan. Unfortunately, Urasan has a dagger next to his name. That's because Urasan died in a drowning accident uh, shortly before the journal went to press. But he died in, in August and he died um, uh, very soon before this, this, uh, the, the issue in which that appears went to press. So we know that the journal was really on top of things. And, and when it said Scheinfinkel was in Moscow in August of that year, it probably really meant that Scheinfinkel was in Moscow in August of that year. Okay, so let me not talk about, because um, I'm spending way too long here, um, the details of that, that paper. Um, let, me, let me talk about the only other paper that Scheinfinkel wrote. And that other paper was written, it's the paper that's actually much more cited than the paper than the paper on combinators. It's a paper he wrote with Paul Bernays. It came out in 1927, although Paul Bernays and Moses Scheinfinkel gave a talk about this paper in 1921 to the Göttingen Mathematical Society. So it had been in gestation for a long time. And uh, this paper is about the decision problem for mathematical logic. It's a, it's a nice but somewhat technical paper about uh, the particular case of the decision problem. Okay, what's probably more interesting for us right now is in the Benai's archive, uh, we have the following. We have the notebook of Scheinfinkel's draft of this paper. And so at the beginning of this, it says, uh, it says there, um, that's the signature line from Moses Scheinfinkel here, just saying where he lived at that time. And that checks out with the addresses that we have. 
Um, but uh, this book, I think he originally intended for a different purpose because it actually lists, you know, there's talks from Hilbert on these days of the week and, and so on and so on and so on. But then page one uh, on the, um, with the byline of Moses Schoenfenkel and Göttingen on the decision problem of mathematical logic. So this was written um, certainly before Schoenfenkel left in 1922. Well, that from the address at the bottom, we know it's written in 1921 or 1922. And this is, uh, this is his version of what became the paper that he co-authored with, with Bernays, that Bernays basically finished in 1927. Okay, now what did he say in this version? So we have, we have uh, there are two books of this. We have all the pages. Uh, some of it is quite technical, but I want to tell you what he said at the beginning of this paper because it's quite interesting. Um, the uh, the kind of the the what he what he described the introduction to this paper. Okay, um, let's see. The, well, I, I would like to say the final paper, as written by Bernays, begins the central problem of mathematical logic, which is closely connected to axiomatic foundations, is the decision problem, and it deals with the following logical formulas. Blah 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 blah. Okay, now let me read you Scheinfinkel's version of the same thing. Okay. And um, this is translated by, by a person at my company and I, I, the, the original German, I, I can't read you, so I'm sorry. Um, okay, so uh, Scheinfenkel said, generality has always been the goal, the ideal of the mathematician. Generality in the solution, in the method, in the concept and formulation of the theorem, in the problem and question, this tendency is even more pronounced and clearer with modern mathematicians than with earlier ones and reaches its high point in the work of Hilbert and Ms. Nerva. Such an ideal finds its most extreme expression when one faces the problem of quotes, solving all problems, at least all mathematical problems, because everything else is easy as soon as this Gordian knot is cut because the world is written in mathematical letters, according to Hilbert. So already this is kind of interesting because he's basically saying what he's trying to do is have a way of, he's trying to use this modern mathematics, these ideas from mathematics that have emerged from the work of people like Hilbert and Noether. He's trying to use that to, as he says in the end, solve all problems. Is there a way of using this kind of formalism that's been developed to solve all problems. Now, you know, when I first read that, I thought, oh, this is just some, some math person who's very unworldly and so on. But then I thought about it a bit more. And that's basically, if I'd been trying to describe what is computation, what's the idea of, of, of universal computation, and I'd been trying to describe that in 1921, this is pretty close to what I think somebody would have said. I think this is sort of a description of, in, couched in terms of mathematics, we've now got to this point of having mathematical formalism that has the potential to solve all problems. Now he attributes to Hilbert this idea because the world is mathematical, it's written in mathematical letters according to Hilbert. Now remember that Hilbert had just spent 20 years trying to reduce physics to mathematics, trying to axiomatize physics. So I think that was sort of a reflection of Hilbert's, the world is written in mathematical letters uh, as in physics can be mathematicized. So Scheinfinkel goes on to say, in just the previous century, Mathematicians would have been extremely skeptical and even adverse to such fantasies. But today's mathematician has already been trained and tested in the formal achievements of modern mathematics and Hilbert's axiomatics. And nowadays one has the courage and the boldness to dare to touch this question as well. We owe to mathematical logic, the fact that we are able to reach to have such a question at all. So it's kind of kind of interesting to see his, his, um, his kind of, uh, uh, this idea that mathematical logic has managed to get us to the threshold of being able to ask sort of the arbitrary formal question. He goes on, a couple more paragraphs are worth, worth hearing here. So now he says, from Leibniz's bold conjectures, the great logician mathematicians went step by step in pursuit of this goal. In the systematic structure of mathematical logic, Boole, discoverer of the logical calculus, Balzano, question mark, Ernst Schroeder, Frege, Piano, Ms. Ladd Franklin, the two purses, Schaeffer, Whitehead, Kuterat, Huntington, Padua, Shatanovsky, Schleszinski, Kagan, Poretsky, Lowenheim, Skolem, and their numerous students, collaborators, and contemporaries. Until in 1910 to 1914, 
the system in quotes by Bertrand Russell and Whitehead appeared, the famous Principia Mathematica, a mighty titanic work, a large system. Finally came our knowledge of logic from Hilbert's lectures on the algebra of logic and calculus and following on this, the groundbreaking work of Hilbert's students, Bernays and Bayman. The investigations of these, all these scholars and researchers have led in no uncertain terms to the fact that it has become clear that actual mathematics represents a branch of logic. This emerges most clearly from the treatment and conception of mathematical logic that Hilbert has given. And now thanks to Hilbert's approach, we can satisfactorily formulate the great decision problem of mathematical logic. So, okay, so I, I consider this introduction fairly interesting because this is basically a, an attempt to sort of describe how general this idea of what would eventually be the idea of symbolic expressions, the idea of symbolic computation would be. It's also interesting to just see what, who he lists as the famous logicians. There are, there are a bunch of ones that I think many people would list today. Uh, this Christine uh, Ladd Franklin is not particularly well known today. Uh, she was a student of Charles Peirce's uh, she actually wrote a paper that, that uh, had a very nice, called Algebra of Logic, which had a nice truth table, which was uh, 40 years before Post and Wittgenstein did that. Um, but she also, I think the way that, uh, that, um, uh, that Scheinfinkel probably knew about her is in 1891, she'd worked in Göttingen with a person called Georg Müller, who was a, uh, uh, she worked on color vision with an experimental psychologist who was still a professor in Göttingen at the time when, uh, when Scheinfinkel was there. Um, so I also find it really charming that he mentions the Principia Mathematica as a mighty titanic work. Now remember the Titanic sank in 1912. And so I think that to me, I, I, I would might describe it the same way as a titanic work that was eventually going to crash among other things on the iceberg of Gödel's theorem in 1931. So it's rather, rather a charming thing that he, that he would write that. Um, well, okay, so this is, um, uh, that, that, that's that, so we have these notebooks and um, uh, the rest of the paper is, is pretty much as Bernays produced it, although Bernays added many examples um, and uh, generalized a couple of aspects of, of what was done in that paper. But that's kind of the story there. Um, now, okay, what else do we know about what, what Scheinfinkel did? We have one more footnote we found in, um, uh, let's see, here it is. This is a footnote in the Grundlagen der Mathematik uh, foundations of Mathematics, which Bernays and Hilbert wrote in the late 1920s. It is a single note that basically says that Scheinfinkel had found a four axiom axiom system for implicational calculus. And then it goes on to say that Tarski found a simpler one and just gives that one. But that's the only other mention we have. So Scheinfinkel was also working on, on implicational calculus there. Um, and, uh, and Bernays or Hilbert knew about that. Um, okay. Well, okay, what else do we know? Um, I'll just summarize what we know in, in um, so then March uh, 24th, uh, March 18th, um, 1924, Scheinfinkel goes to Moscow. After that time, we know nothing definitive more about Scheinfinkel. Um, we don't know uh, what, um, uh, we, we simply know nothing. It's notable at that time, it was pretty easy to get to Moscow. There was a train line, there won't have been any passport issues. Um, it was, uh, we also know that a bunch of people from Moscow State University were, were coming to visit Göttingen at the time, including people like Luzin, who was the, who became sort of the, the head of the department there before he was kind of um, uh, 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 thrown out by Stalin. Um, but uh, he had come to Göttingen. So there was quite a traffic between Göttingen and, um, and Moscow State University specifically. But we don't know whether, uh, whether Scheinfinkel went to Moscow State University. We've been trying to get to the archives at Moscow State University so far have not succeeded. Um, and uh, um, that's so, so we don't know anything from that. And um, we do know one, we have one thing here. Um, the closest we have to, so, so uh, we, have, we have two facts. Okay, one fact that I'll, I guess I'll come to later, but I'll, I'll mention it here, is a note uh, from Curry uh, dated November 1927. And that note says, let's see whether, um, uh, let's see, where is this note? Yes, okay. Um, I'm, I'm skipping a little bit ahead in the story, but this is another piece of information. Okay, so uh, it says this is Curry in 1927. A uh, person called uh, Pavel Alexandrov, who's a topologist, was visiting Princeton, where Curry was at that time. Curry had found Scheinfinkel's paper, 
and he went to talk to this Alexandrov guy to find find out what what was the story of of Scheinfinkel because it said that Scheinfinkel was in Moscow, and it says here that uh, this Curry writing um, the latter Alexandrov says that Scheinfinkel has has since gone insane and is now in a sanatorium and probably will not be able to work anymore. Okay, so that's that's the piece of evidence we have that something went horribly wrong with Scheinfinkel. Now it's even difficult to interpret that piece of evidence because Curry says sanatorium, okay? In, in American, well, okay, so at, at that time, a sanatorium in Russia would have been a place you went for a rest cure for something like tuberculosis. In American, that was becoming the word for an insane asylum, um, but it was also still used as the word for a place you went for a rest cure. So we don't actually know completely what that really meant. But anyway, it says maybe Scheinfinkel had some mental illness issue, but we don't know for sure. Um, we do know, so the closest we have to sort of any documentation about that is the following statement. So this is written by a woman called uh, Sofia uh, Yanovskaya in 1948. Uh, Sofia Yanovskaya was a mathematical logician at, um, uh, at Moscow State University, and she wrote a, a summary of mathematical logic in the Soviet Union. And she writes, the work of M.I. Scheinfinkel played a substantial role in the further development of mathematical logic. This brilliant student of S.O. Shatanovsky unfortunately left us early after getting mentally ill, and there's a Russian word for that, which I, I'm not, um, uh, there's a, some subtlety in translation. Scheinfinkel passed away in Moscow in 1942. He did the work mentioned here in 1920, but only published it in 1924, edited by Bayman. Okay, so that's the, that's the closest we have to kind of a contemporary statement about what happened. Now, there's actually a little bit more to this. Sofia uh, uh, Yanovskaya um, was about eight years younger than Scheinfinkel. She went to the same university as Scheinfinkel in Odessa. And in fact, her professor was the same person, Shatanovsky. Um, in Odessa. So when she says that Scheinfinkel was a student of Shatanovsky, brilliant student of Shatanovsky, she might have known what she was talking about because she knew Shatanovsky. Shatanovsky had been her professor too. So, but, um, as f but it's a little bit more complicated than that because um, uh, Sofia Yanovskoja um, was, she was a student in, in Odessa right at the time the Russian Revolution broke out and she got seriously into the whole revolution thing and became basically a party operative and um, eventually began to teach first at a place called the Institute of Red Professors, but then at Moscow State University. But for many years, she was the person who was involved in trying to match up the Marxist Leninist uh, kind of ideology and, and dialectic and so on um, with formal ideas in mathematics that have been kind of like, should we really do this formalist mathematics or is it inconsistent with communist ideas? And she was the person who was supposed to be the matcher for how that worked. So she had a, some access to grind. Now I, I, I'm going to, um, um, and one of the reasons, so why on earth did Scheinfinkel go to Moscow? We don't know. One theory is he was excited about communism. Don't know if that's the case. Uh, you might've thought, you know, oh, all these mathematicians in Göttingen must be in the hotbed of communism. Not true. Uh, in fact, when Gossman was arrested um, in 1933, even, um, it was a big deal. It wasn't, communism wasn't a thing. And, and the university went on a big investigation who had been recruited as a communist. It wasn't a hotbed of communism. So if Scheinfinkel was into communism, it was his own thing, not something that was associated with lots of people at the university. So then uh, the, um, so that's one theory. Um, another theory is he went to Moscow State University. Certainly he would have known people there. Another theory is um, his, uh, um, uh, his, his, um, his father's business partner and uncle, Aaron Lurie, um, had a bunch of children, including some who I think ended up in Moscow. So he may have had relatives in Moscow as well. It's also the case that um, in Ekaterina's love, the, um, uh, the, the much of the... Uh, there was a large Jewish population in Ekaterinoslav that had actually come from Moscow. So there may have been other people he knew there. Okay, so we, we really know um, very little. I can tell you that the small fragments that we do know, 
Um, but in any case, the, the uh, uh, Sofia uh, Yanashkoja, little bit of question uh, we'll come to about to whether there was sort of a, a, a party line kind of thing that was going on in some of the comments she might have made about Scheinfinkel. But that's, that's another piece of evidence that, um, uh, that he became mentally ill in some way. Um, uh, of course, he will have been in his 50s in 1942, so he didn't die that young if he died in 1942. Okay, so what other information do we have? Well, we're really, you know, clutching at, you know, getting scraps, we're clutching at straws here. If you go to the talk page for the Wikipedia entry for, um, for Scheinfinkel, you find the following completely anonymous comment, okay? It says, William Hatcher, while spending time in St. Petersburg during the 1990s, was told by Soviet mathematicians that Schoenfinkel died in wretched poverty, having no job and but one room in a collective apartment. After his death, the rough ordinary people who shared his apartment burned his manuscripts for fuel, Peren World War II was raging. The few Soviet mathematicians around 1940 who had any discussions with Scheinfinkel later said that those manuscripts reinvented a great deal of 20th century mathematical logic. Scheinfinkel had no way of accessing the work of Turing, Church, and Tarski, but to derive their results for himself. Stalin did not order Scheinfinkel shot or deported to Siberia, but blame for Scheinfinkel's death and inability to publish in his final years can be placed on Stalin's doorstep. Okay, that's what you get for anonymous comments in Wikipedia. Who knows what that was or who wrote it? But you can look at the IP address. And the IP address is the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. And I know several, uh, maybe some people are on this live stream um, from, um, uh, from that university. So of course I've asked them, did any of you write this? So far, nobody said they wrote it. I tried to track down William Hatcher and his story. Uh, talked to people at the Steckhoff Institute in St. Petersburg where William Hatcher was indeed a visitor at that time. They have not heard this story. So, so far, all leads there are cold, but we have this, we have at least a claim here that's made with some level of detail or at least embellishment about what happened. Okay, so the thing we'd like to do, uh, one question is, is there a death certificate for Scheinfinkel? Does the, do the Russian authorities have a death certificate? In most countries, you can just go ask for death certificates. Uh, apparently in Russia, you can't. Death certificates are only given to direct relatives. Okay, so that raises the question, can we find a relative of Moses Scheinfinkel? So needless to say, by the time we've turned over this many rocks, you can guess we've been, we've been trying to do that. So let me, let me give you a little bit of information about that. So first of all, Nathan Scheinfinkel, um, as I mentioned, he was a graduate student in Bern in physiology department. Um, he studied, his thesis was on uh, gas exchange and metamorphosis of amphibian larva, larvae after feeding on the thyroid gland or substances containing iodine. He got his PhD in 1922. He became a private descent. And of course we can needless to say, find all his documents uh, from the University of Bern. Um, the, uh, he, he stayed as a professor at University of Bern um, until 1947. Um, he became a Swiss citizen in 1932. Uh, we have the naturalization documents, which sadly don't list any children. Um, so uh, uh, in, in 1947, he actually moved to Turkey and he was a founder, uh, founding professor in a medical school in Ankara, Turkey. Um, and then he moved uh, to another university, Ege University in Izmir, Turkey. Um, and then at the age of 67 in 1961, he retired and, and, and went back to, to, to Switzerland. There's a picture of, of uh, Nathan Scheinfinkel. That was the person who wrote the um, uh, um, the um, the letter to Hilbert about Moses Scheinfinkel. Um, but so it doesn't seem like he had any children. We actually were able to locate um, uh, a um, uh, a person in um, who had known who had actually uh, translated into Turkish the lectures of of Nathan Scheinfinkel when he was first at the university in Turkey, um, and she told us um, uh, that uh, she remembered. Uh, Nathan Scheinfinkel and his wife and knew even where they lived, but didn't remember them ever mentioning children and there didn't seem to be any evidence of children, although the children would by that point have been somewhat grown up. So, so far as we can tell, no children from Nathan Scheinfinkel. Okay, so the next question is, were there any more Scheinfinkel kids? Okay, for that, you have to go look at the birth records. We haven't gone through all of them, but uh, this was a bit of a find. Uh, December 20th, 1889, uh, there is another Scheinfinkel, Deborah Scheinfinkel was born. So Moses Scheinfinkel had a younger sister, Deborah. And uh, we know that she graduated from seventh grade in 1907. That's the last we know of her. So 
there's another another possible um and by the way there were probably pretty large families at that time for example um uh, we know that um, uh, Moses Scheinfinkel's mother, uh, Maria Masha Scheinfinkel, uh, Masha Luri originally, came from a family of eight children. So it's quite possible there are more Scheinfinkel, relative, more Scheinfinkel siblings around there. Now, unfortunately, um, the, uh, uh, we know that Scheinfinkel's mother died in 1936 at the age of 74. Um, uh, were there any other Scheinfinkel relatives in Ekaterinoslav? Well, there's a very nasty piece of history here because in uh, February of 1942, uh, I, I should say uh, Ekaterinoslav was a place where there was a large Jewish population, maybe 30% of the, of the town was, was Jewish. Um, and in, in February of 1942, uh, basically the whole population of 30,000 uh, uh, Jewish, the, the whole 30,000 Jewish population of Scheinfinkel was killed in a four day period. So, if the relatives of Scheinfinkel had still been in Ekaterinoslav at that time, they would not have survived World War II. But um, we're still curious. We're still hoping we will actually find a relative of Scheinfinkel. Um, and uh, perhaps they'll know something about their great great uncle, or perhaps um, uh, perhaps they'll allow us to, to see the death records if, if, the, if the Russian registry really has those. Okay, final thing to, to talk about here, I suppose, is, is how, did, how did Combinators make it into the world as it is today? Well, the, the key person who was responsible for that is Haskell Curry. Um, so Haskell Curry, uh, born in, in Massachusetts, his parents, uh, his mother ran a school of elocution and expression that became the school of expression that his father, who was a professor of elocution, also worked at. They ran the school for quite a few years. The school eventually became a place called Curry College, which strangely enough is a place we've held our annual summer school at a few times. Um, anyway, Curry College was started by the, the, by the parents of Haskell Curry. Haskell Curry himself um, went to Harvard for college um, and uh, um, uh, did mathematics, um, started off after college, uh, started doing electrical engineering, worked for GE, um, also was at MIT, um, and then didn't really like that very much, went back to Harvard, and started uh, working uh, with a person called Percy Bridgman. Uh, Percy Bridgman was primarily an experimental physicist who did high, high, uh, high pressure physics, but he had a sideline and his sideline was a philosophy of, 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 uh, of physics. And actually at the time when Curry will have interacted with him, he will have been writing a book which was eventually called The Logic of Modern Physics. And perhaps as a result of that, um, Curry, um, uh, perhaps that's how Curry got exposed to um, uh, to Principia Mathematica. No, that's the wrong document. Let me see whether I have the right document here. Um, ah, I don't have the right document. There's a there's a document um, which is notes on. Is this the right thing? No, that's not the right thing. Oh well. Um, there are some notes that that uh, uh, exist from 1922 about. Um, um, uh, about Principia Mathematica by Curry. Um, and it's, it's kind of fun. He's, he's, he's kind of, he's, he's trying to read Principia Mathematica a little bit like an electrical engineer or like a sort of pre-programmer. Um, he's actually very interested in the processes of mathematical logic, not just what you get out, but how you do it. And he says, no logical process is possible without the phenomenon of substitution. And he tries to break down this process of substitution. And then slightly peculiarly at the end of this document, um, See if I can bring up this document in some form here. here. Um, at the end of this document, um, he says he has a little sort of uh, um, note. Let's see if I can bring this up here. Um, uh, he has a little note here that says um, uh, phylogenetic origin of logic, one sensation, two association, red hot poker dash law of permanence. Not quite sure what that means, but it's an attempt to sort of philosophize, I suppose. Uh, the nature of logic and its relationship to, to sort of human activity. In any case, so, so Curry got interested in, um, uh, in mathematical logic, perhaps from Percy Bridgman, uh, maybe others know more uh, how he got interested in it, but I think that's a pretty good theory. Um, but he, as a, as a practical matter, people told him, oh, you can't work on logic and there's nothing happening in logic. He worked with Garrett Birkhoff on differential equations for a number of years, um, got kind of bored with that, and decided to switch to logic, and then ended up spending a year as an instructor at Princeton University. And at Princeton University, he encountered 
in, um, in the library at Princeton University. He found Scheinfinkel's paper from 1924. And these are the notes that he made on finding that paper. And he says, you know, um, it has a, a date stamp. It says, you know, uh, this paper anticipates much of what I have done, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, uh, um, I think that if we're trying to read, you know, what did Curry really do? Um, well, uh, okay, so, so actually Curry, after, after writing this, after making his comments on, on what Schoenfinkel did, um, Curry decided that uh, uh, clearly the place to study the kinds of things he was interested in was Göttingen, and uh, he would go to Göttingen, and he planned to go the next year to Göttingen. And sort of in preparation for that, he wrote a paper uh, that was entitled An Analysis of Logical Substitution. Um, and that paper, uh, let's see, um, that paper has, um, uh, is, is quite interesting. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of his, his first foray into talking about combinator-like things. And I'm afraid the beginning of it is a little bit term paper-like. You know, um, uh, it's, um, I hope I have added clearness, he footnotes, uh, added clearness to certain points where the existing treatments are obscure. Not quite sure he did that, but um, in any case, it was a it was a it was a, an early paper, I would say. Um, but um, then in that paper, uh, what is that? That's some um, the key thing that happens in that paper is a footnote um, that says uh, this is kind of breaking down things, laws of inference. Steps have already been taken. Footnote to uh, to Schoenfinkel, and um, then. The next page, which I don't seem to have here. How did I not have that? The next page basically um, talks about how you can have, um, uh, how you can, um, how you and how you can, um, um, uh, how you can kind of construct things with different permutations. And there he references Schoenfinkel as a way to do that. And what he then does is to, um, he gives Schoenfinkel's um, S and K combinators, and then he gives a fairly, uh, a fairly simple description of essentially what he's doing is he's trying to take combinators and reproduce permutations with combinators. And he goes on for, for a while um, I, I realized I got. To, I just was looking at this last night, and I realized I've got to actually uh, run the code, which is easy right now, to find the minimal combinators that do these permutations. Maybe people have already done that. But in any case, I think at this point, uh, you know, Curry was very uh, keen on kind of the um, uh, uh, sort of slowly understanding how combinators work, but really uh, tried to mathematicize combinators and tried to turn them into something where you could set up an axiom system, understand what equality meant, all those kinds of things. And that's, that was kind of the direction that he went and, and went for many years. I think uh, he only, you know, he, he came to understand combinators. He, he named combinators. Um, in fact, his first paper already starts talking about them as um, uh, combinatory combinations, I think. Um, and then this, uh, this uh, second paper that he wrote while he was in Göttingen, strangely published in an American journal, but written in, in German, um, was the Foundations of Combinatory Logic. Um, well, in any case, so I think the... Um, uh, this um, um, uh, we can kind of trace a little bit of what um, um, uh, uh, of what um, of what Curry did, um, but I think it, it took a while for him to understand things like what the S combinator was really about. I think the the um, sort of our our, our conclusion um, the um, um, it's. Uh, um, well, okay, there's more to say about kind of the path of how things went from curry to, to everything we know today about combinators, but I've, I've yacked for far too long here. Maybe I should just wrap up by sort of saying that, that um, uh, you know, I, I've tried to give some sketch of combinators, combinators in the wild, why we care about combinators in the wild, uh, how they relate to things like physics. Um, I, I've not talked that much about combinators and their relationship to functional programming and, and language design. Um, that's a very interesting different direction. Um, I think I, I would I would close by kind of saying that um, uh, what we um, uh, uh, what we what we saw um, for the for the first time a um, uh, hundred years ago in in the in the talk that was given by Moses Scheinfinkel was kind of a, a, a first glimpse 
not only of universal computation, but also the general idea of symbolic expressions, the general idea of transformation rules for symbolic expressions, things that have led to just a, a huge amount of very, very fertile activity. And we don't, I don't think the end of the story is yet told. As I say, NANDs have been a big thing, combinators haven't in the practical doing of computing. But maybe as we get towards molecular computing and so on, maybe combinators will be back. And maybe in fact, in time, all those things that right now we think of as being, oh, it's just NANDs and, uh, and circuits, maybe there'll be something very much like combinators that's running those, just as we think there's now something very much like that that's running our whole universe. So, okay, to, to end, maybe I can just, uh, I have a, a little combinator, uh, combinator birthday, uh, birthday card or something here. Let's see if I can run this. So this is a combinator to, to, to recognize the, uh, the 100th anniversary of combinators. Um, this is a, a combinator that, if it works according to plan, that, uh, that's, the, that's a representation of the initial combinator. This is the evolution of the combinator. And this combinator has a fixed point that has, it's a pure S, it's a pure S combinator expression, and its fixed point has 100 S's in it. So, okay, uh, happy 100th birthday to, uh, to combinators. And I'm sorry that I went on just outrageously longer than I expected. My apologies for that. Um, I hope uh, people found this of interest and um, uh, look forward to having whatever discussion we can. Um, sorry I've gone on so long. Um, Let's see, do we have uh, people who want to make uh, comments here? Um, I do. Great, please. Um, well, one th interesting thing about uh, Schoenfinkel was he only represented all things in predicate calculus using uh, combinators and his generalized NAND, whereas, but he had no, uh, uh, rules of inference for this NAND. And the big difference with Curry and Church was that uh, they had combinators or lambda calculus plus uh, a, a restricted generality, as Curry called it. And Church had something very similar. So that's how they could do the foundations of logic. Uh, another comment is that uh, you mentioned uh, car uh, combinators and computing. Uh, in 1942, Curry volunteered for war work, war work and uh, he finished up joining the group that developed the first computers in the States. After the war, he went back to his university, Penn State, and asked the president to buy him a computer. Uh, the president said no, and he went back to theoretical work in combinatorial logic. Do you know if he contributed to the ENIAC? Do you know it all? Yes, no. yes, yes. He was part of the group that uh, that uh, that. Uh, so why weren't there any combinators in the ENIAC? Well, why I don't know. Work? That's an interesting question. Yes. The, yeah. Does anybody know here? I I, I think we have. Um, um, uh, I know we have many experts on both combinators and their history. And I, I as I said, I you guys are like the the David Hilbert sitting in the front row for for Moses yeah. Scheinfinkel's talk. So, yes, so I think um, I'm the only student of Carrie's here. Uh, let's see. We invited several who's- John Seldon would have been one, but uh, I don't yes. see him. Um, I, I am curious whether you know more about, um, uh, you know, the, the remarks that I made about Curry and his, um, his kind of, uh, you know, what he was doing before Scheinfenkel and so on. Is there, is there more to know there? I mean, I've certainly read the footnotes he wrote and, and all those kinds of things. Well, the only other thing I know is that uh, uh, Bernays was very influential so, uh, uh, for Curry. So uh, uh, other than that, uh, no. Yes, I think Bernays uh, worked with, uh, and, um, uh, I mean, Curry went to work with Bernays in the end. In, yes, in yes. Now, let's see, Owen Engeler, who might have been here, was a student of Bernays. Uh, we were talking recently about um, uh, what... Um, uh, what Bernays had told Owen Engler um, about Schoenfinkel, and unfortunately not very much. Um, uh, but um, um, so we really don't know, um, yeah, we really we know little about that. Um, let's see, the, um, we have, uh, 
um, oh my, there's, there's, there's tons and tons of things here. Let's see, who would like to, maybe people would like to make some remarks about what they see as the significance of, of combinators in, in, in the world at large or any historical remarks. I, I know um, uh, um, uh, many people here have worked on combinators, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm but an amateur, so to speak. Um, uh, perhaps people would like to, to comment on things, please. So you were working with S and K. Now, if you want to describe functions using S and K, uh, you get exponential expressions of them. However, if you use more combinators, you can do it in a quadratic way and, and Curry did that. That's interesting. And then the best of these results is by Statman. Uh, he is able to get an n log n uh, abstraction uh, operator. The disadvantage of Statman's um, abstraction is that it's asymptotically n log n, but you need the big machinery to do that. So uh, those complexity measures are not always the best way to look at things, but you could have a look at, at this. I think one of the questions I've been curious about is to find the real threshold of computation universality for combinators. And is it S alone? It can't be smaller than uh, three goes to four. Um, I looked at all the things smaller than that, and I think it's clear that none of them are universal. But there are some other candidates in three goes to four. Um, and uh, it's in my long time search for kind of the ultimate thresholds of universality. Why do I care about the thresholds of universality? I care because it gives us a sense of where undecidability, how far away undecidability is in mathematics and physics and other kinds of things. Um, it also is potentially very valuable if we're trying to build actual computers out of things like molecules to know what the, what the simplest building blocks can be. But that's a thing I, I was hoping to take a look at is, um, uh, is, is are there, you know, what I find really remarkable about, about S and K is, um, 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 is, is, the, is the fact that uh, Scheinfinkel got so close to the very simplest possible uh, in a way that Turing and people like that were not even vaguely in the, in the ballpark of the simplest possible um, uh, Turing machines and so on. Let's see, do other people have comments on, on perhaps the, the significance, the future of combinators, the, um, uh, and I, I talked mostly about combinators, not about lambda calculus, obviously here. Um, well, I, I could uh, comment on uh, the um, applicability to modern computing. Um, one of the uh, in, uh, incredible things that we have in a computer today is the random access memory. And uh, if you have, a, for example, a terabyte uh, solid state drive, uh, you're able to access an enormous amount of data. And the key to that is the address decoding logic. Uh, now, this gives you a whole new view of uh, computational complexity once you've got this random access. And I don't see its counterpart in anything that you can construct with combinators. Right. I mean, the decoder tree, the, the concept of an address in a computer, that there is a logarithmic sized address that can address all of these all of these pieces of memory. That decoder tree is an interesting thing. Now, if you're doing things with molecules, you may not care so much about a decoder tree because you've got an awful lot of molecules. And if your molecules are basically in their chemical reactions, they're basically tracking down one of these multi-way graphs, you may not care as much. It yeah, may come so to seem that, um, uh, you know, that, that idea of, oh, let's find a numerical address for things wasn't so important. But I agree with you that that's a, that's a key feature yeah. of, of, of modern computers as we have them today. Yeah, I think I, 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 I gave you a couple of private questions. I think it was about six questions, and that, that was one of them. And I suggested in one of them that uh, uh, computational equivalence was perhaps more appropriate for physics than for computation, given that computation today is so critically dependent on random access. Well, I think that the, I mean, the question of what the computational complexity of things is relative to that, you know, how difficult is it to do something and how important is it that you have random access and so on? You know, I don't really know the answer to that. For example, that simplest axiom system for Boolean algebra that I found, you might think 
oh, if you've got the simplest axiom system for Boolean algebra, that's a crazy thing to use to actually prove theorems. It's not true. After it proves a few lemmas, it's as efficient as anything. I mean, in a sense, it's not surprising that, you know, once you've got a few lemmas, you can, you can go ahead and prove things. But I don't think it's so totally obvious that, uh, the, you know, the, the way we have it today, for sure, and one of the things we realize is, the, the, in a sense, it's like, how does mathematics get built? It's, it's like, we have all these possible theorems that could be, get built in the, you know, in the history of actual mathematics, about 3 million of them have been published, but there's an infinite number of possibilities. Which ones have we actually built? How do we explore that? What are, the, what are all the paths of mathematics that we didn't follow? Well, once we followed the paths we followed, with, there's a certain, we've locked into a certain direction of abstraction, a certain way of thinking about things. I think that's probably the same kind of thing with computing, that we're kind of locked into a particular direction. We've built a lot of layers. It's kind of like what you see in one of the things, not my favorite, in floating point arithmetic, or nowadays in neural networks. We're picking, you know, these are the ways we're going to do floating point arithmetic. These are what the neural processing units are going to look like. So then we're going to build everything on top of those particular foundations, even though they may not have been the best foundation. So I, I, I guess I, I feel like it's kind of like in mathematics, there are all these possible theorems to explore. We build particular branches in the kind of the big multi-way graph of all possible theorems. Um, it's sort of interesting to, to realize, you know, if we just jump off and go anywhere in mathematical space, we'll tend to end up with undecidable things. It's a feature of the fact that we built in these layers that we're able to get to things where we can actually decide them. It's it, in a sense, that's the same reason we get to things that we can engineer with. We get to things for which we have the cognitive processes available to be able to do engineering. For combinators, for example, we didn't build those. We don't know how to think in terms of combinators, at least I don't, maybe, maybe a few people here do, but, but uh, mostly we don't have that. I mean, it's a little bit like, even with NAND, you know, you go looking in human languages, you say, do any human languages have a word for NAND? I believe the answer is no. Some of them have words for exclusive or, none of them have words for NAND. It's not been something that us humans seem to think in terms of. And so that's a, you know, it's a question, is there a way to think in terms of combinators? And had we had a hundred years of development of thinking in terms of combinators, would we be now having a discussion where somebody says, oh, well, you were talking about the invention of the decoder tree. And somebody would say, decoder tree, why do you need a thing like that? You know, after all, it's just working with combinators. I, I think that's a, um, 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 as, but, far, but, uh, yeah. as far as NAND goes in the natural language, uh, the word is inconsistent, uh, namely, uh, neither this nor that, you're saying, I don't want either this or that. So that actually does, uh, is, is perfectly understood in natural language. As far as address decoding and combinators go, you could do the following. Uh, with that uh, normal form evaluation uh, that you were assuming for co uh, combinatory expressions, so you've got a stack of them, when you just evaluate starting from the left end, then uh, what you can do is you can pick off uh, a few bits of the top and use that in a table lookup for, let's say, a terabyte uh, memory. And what that table lookup does is it tells you what those first few combinators at the left end of the expression should, will eventually reduce to. Uh, it might even say, well, it's going to diverge, or it might just come back and say it reduces to itself. But uh, in principle, you might be able to short circuit a few million steps of the computation with a single lookup. And so you replace the top of the stack with whatever the table says it's going to eventually reduce to. So that would be one way to incorporate uh, address decoding logic into uh, a combinatory uh, computer. Uh, it would- That's a good uh, idea. The, it would I have think the you potential. sent me mail about that and I didn't have a chance to really dig into it because I was- All ah, right, yes, just... this, is, this is all from a class that I taught in uh, 1995. Um, and the class was uh, the usual uh, formal languages and, and computability class that we teach both at MIT and at Stanford. Uh, that year, the T teaching assistant was Isaac Chuang, who some of you may know as uh, one of the first people to build a real working quantum computer, but he was also a very good TA for that class. And in that class, I, I was teaching the Kleene recursion theorem. And I thought, oh, this is ridiculous. Kleene doesn't tell us what the actual Gödel number is for all these theorems. So I said, well, how would we make up a programming language that had uh, the Gödel numbers for the theorems that you could actually just write down the number in decimal and read it right off as a combinator expression. So you'd say, okay, S is gonna be, let's say three, I think it was, 
and the whole thing would be done in de decimal. Uh, eight and nine were left and right parentheses. Uh, zero was the universal uh, computer. And so you have a string of zeros off to the left that uh, just are meaningless because they just tell you, well, uh, you've done that. Uh, so you have one as the successor operation, two as S. Um, I think the way I'd implement, and then there's a predecessor operation. So if you have successor, predecessor, and S, uh, that's enough to implement K. So you only need those three. Uh, and you can also replace predecessor with uh, the uh, church numeral operation as an alternative to predecessor. They both are interchangeable. Uh, and so that gives you a, a fairly succinct language. And since you've only used up a few decimal symbols, well, why not you have a couple more for W and B and uh, C, uh, the other ones that are quite useful. And so you end up using all 10 decimals, and now you can just start writing down numbers in normal decimal. And uh, I wrote an, I think it was either I or Isaac uh, Chung, Ike uh, Chuang, uh, one of us wrote an actual interpreter for uh, combinators done that way, where you just pick, take the number, look at it in decimal, and figure out how to reduce it. And uh, by the same token, it could be using hexadecimal, uh, so six, uh, four bit uh, uh, things. Uh, and so each four bit quantity, if you took four of them at a time, that would be a 16 bit address. And so you now look up your terabyte data to say, oh, uh, the top four uh, terms in this uh, uh, decimal number, uh, or not decimal, hexadecimal number now, uh, tell you what's going to happen a few million steps from now or 10 steps from now. That's really interesting. So did you implement this? Is that, can we well, find we it? Not as hardware, no. <laughs> I was thinking about implementing it and then uh, I, I said, oh, I'll get around to it. And uh, that was 1995 and uh, maybe I'll get around to it now that you've uh, provided a little bit of uh, incentive here to go back and look at combinators. That's interesting. I mean, I, I suspect that there are very interesting things that can be done when you when you have sort of the computational process as exposed as it, as it is in combinators. You know, one of the things that I'm not satisfied with in the way that we do sort of symbolic processing today is the lack of tracing of what's going on. You evaluate something and the result comes out. What we want, for example, from physics, one of the things we've learned is the value of this causal graph business, the value of understanding the causal connections between things that happened. We don't have causal graphs in the, in the, uh, for our usual evaluations. And I think that's one of the kinds of things that's rather easy to build from something like combinators and something that I was uh, sort of now motivated to really understand how you add causal graphs into usual evaluation processes. Well, with this design of a computer that I was suggesting, where you just look up what the answer is to the top few symbols on the stack, uh, the causal part of it might be actually quite complicated depending on how long uh, the run was that led to that answer. So in one step, you get the answer, but the cause of it could be enormously long. So you'd have a second backup memory that you would go to if you were trying to debug things. Uh, so that you could look to see how it managed to take this 10 steps or million steps or whatever it took to get to the answer in one step. Uh, and that would let you uh, look into the, the trace. And that would just be a permanent thing that was attached to your terabyte right. memory. And God knows how big it would have to be. It might have to be a lot more than a terabyte uh, to store all that data. But at least it would give you a way to completely trace everything that was going on, even though you had this uh, speed up method. Oh, that's cool. Let's see, do other people, because I, I know we've got so many combinator people here. Yeah, I, I would like to make a couple uh, comments Please. and a question. So uh, first of all, I, I want to thank Stephen for bringing us together. It's so neat to see all the, all the friends. Hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, also thank you for doing the, the historical research you've done to shed the light on this uh, lost chapter of the in the foundations of mathematics. I mean. Uh, and one thing that really struck me in the story is that um, it seemed that Sean Finkel um, actually believed in the Hilbert's dream. Uh, it seems that he actually believed that the decision problem for uh, whether it's Principia Mathematica or first of the logic that, that that was actually solvable. And that that paper that the other paper he did with Bernays was sort of making progress on that, the, the Sean Finkel class. Right. So, um, and, and of course this whole story is, is, is very tragic, but I think one of the tragedies is, is that uh, it, I would have really loved to know 
uh, what would have happened. It, it's really sad that Sean Filken never got to meet Godel, and it would have been really interesting to see what was his reaction um, to Godel. Yes, 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 I hadn't even thought of that. Does anybody know why Curry didn't try to meet Sean Finkel? Martin, perhaps, do you know? Somebody needs to unmute Martin. Uh, is Martin unmuted? Or... Uh, yeah, I've, okay. right, I've un unmuted myself, yes. No, I don't. Uh, uh, I remember uh, I was Carrie's last student and Carrie was Hilbert's last student. I remember saying to him at one stage, uh, oh, Girdle must be very old by now. And Carrie said, oh, no, he's not. He's younger than I am. <laughs> so, uh, <that's, laughs> but uh, uh, I think uh, Schoenfinkel was uh, back in Moscow by then, by the time Curry got to... Oh, no, uh, absolutely, he was. But yeah, so it was, a, it was the, an easy... The, I think there was no, no way of... Uh, well, yes... Uh, he may not have been easily accessible there. I don't know. Yeah, I just uh, John Selden might. John Selden might know. He knows more about the, the history than I do. It's a pity he's not here. I, I thought he was going to come actually. I, I, yes, um, Andrew, we asked you about go, the. Go go. Ahead. Uh, you asked about the future of combinatorics, and uh, also different ways of thinking. I've been working on these things. Uh, and uh, I have a, a more expressive calculus, a tree calculus, that has just a single operator. And so where you have trees of S's and K's, where the leaves are labeled by S and K, in tree calculus, there are no labels at all. So I call such trees natural trees. So in the same way that natural numbers are linear structures, uh, the natural trees have a bit more dimensionality to them. Are they binary trees or something else? Uh, well, the normal forms are binary trees. They have uh, zero, one or two branches per node. The computations are finitely branching trees. And the reduction process is to try and reduce a finitely branching tree to a binary tree. How, how does it, what, what drives the computation? What, what causes, what are the rules by which the trees are, are transformed? The single operator is a ternary operator, but unlike S and K, it's intentional. It examines its first argument. And so there are three equations according to whether the first argument is a leaf or a stem or a fork. So the rule for leaves is like K, and the rule for stems is like S. And the rule for uh, forks uh, treats the fork as a pair and decomposes the pair into its uh, components. Sounds very interesting. I, you know, I might, might just comment that in, in my efforts to make models of fundamental physics, uh, in the 1990s, I spent a lot of effort trying to do that using trivalent graphs. And one of the issues with that was the rewrite rules for trivalent graphs it was kind of only some rewrite rules would make sense. Others would have the property that they try to generate things of lower symmetry from things of higher symmetry and other kinds of inconsistencies. And so I ended up, uh, you know, one of the things that caused the current burst of activity um, was realizing that one could sort of generalize that by thinking about hypergraphs. And with hypergraphs, you never get into the situation where it's like, oh, that rule can't exist. Um, you, you can just write down any rule you want. They're not necessarily causal invariant, but you can write down any rule you want. And that for me was an important kind of uh, conceptual breakthrough, but I, I have wondered about rewrite, I, I need to look up your, your work. I, I've, I've wondered about sort of the natural rewriting rules for trees, um, because I agree that combinators as such, if, if all you're trying to do is to rewrite an unlabeled tree, they're not the most obvious thing to use. Um, and uh, uh, it sounds really interesting. That's cool. Well, so I've, well I would, I've I would comment on that, oh, Barry. I would, I would yeah. comment on that. Uh, you've got a slightly more complicated uh, branching structure down at the bottom, uh, or actually, I suppose you have these uh, stems, as you call them, halfway up the tree as well as at the bottom. Is that true? Oh, yes. Okay. So that's um, that's uh, interesting, and I don't know quite how to interpret that, but basically, the difference from just a plain S and K thing with S and K. 
uh, you only need binary trees. Uh, and so the S's and the K's are at the leaves. And what you've got is an added level of uh, complexity where you're allowing a unary branch that you're calling a stem. And except for the fact that stems can occur in the middle of the tree, I would say that was just a clever way to encode S and K. But uh, the fact that you can, you don't think so? No, no. Oh, okay. So when you, <laughs> right. when you represent uh, S and K in that way, then the nodes of your trees are applications. Yes. Yes. So that, that my, my trees, are, the nodes are not applications. They are the operator. So replace S and K by a single operator. And, and it's, that's the unlabeled nodes, uh, that operator, not the application. Now, now, do you have a normal form evaluation or can you pick up the evaluation in the middle of the tree? Uh, you, it's uh, equational, just like combinatorial logic. So you can have different evaluation strategies. The way of describing the differences are that you can decide a quality of normal forms by the application of a combination. So in combinatorial logic, decided the quality of normal forms is not uh, decidable by a combinator. More generally, you can do pattern matching so you can write all kinds of pattern matching functions. And uh, I've, I've drafted a book about all of this stuff. Uh, and I have a, uh, a, a combination that does self-interpretation. In fact, I have several of these things. Yeah, so self-interpretation is uh, definitely intentional. You have to look at the arguments in order to, you have to pull them apart in order to figure out uh, how to evaluate. You can't do that. Uh, inside of uh, combinatory logic, unless you do some kind of church encoding. But the church encoding is doing all the interesting work of, of pulling apart the structure to see what's inside. And, uh, and so that work is now done inside tree calculus instead of being some kind of meta theory. Okay, so, so that's not entirely obvious to me. I was sort of imagining that there'd be a straightforward translation from your framework to S and K, but no, you're no, saying a, that there is not. There is not, and the proof mm. has been verified in Koch. Ah, very interesting, yeah. yeah. Okay. So all the proofs in the book have been verified in Koch. It's strictly more expressive. Yeah. It's a simple yeah. translation yeah. of S and K into tree calculus. There is no translation in the other direction that preserves the uh, quality. Yeah, okay. Looks like uh, Andre has uh, given us the link there. Uh, uh, thank you. Andrew. So, so listen, a logistical point, we, we can go to this high fidelity environment where we can have a bunch of separate conversations. Um, I think that will be terrific. Um, but uh, does anybody want to make any 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 last remarks um, for uh, um, uh, as we when we're while well, we're all together here? Famous last words. <laughs> no. Yeah, right. That, that's um, um, Okay, well, great. I think we've we've been broadcasting all of this to the to the world. I think we're we're um, we should probably end it. This has gone on much longer than I expected, um, but uh, it's really interesting to to hear from people here. Um, and uh, well, to people in the outside world, thanks for joining us. And um, 